Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me back here in Tiano, the last of Europe, in which we are playing as, of course, a Siberian free territory, but a new adventure waits. The clock chimed once more, indicating it was now 3 o'clock in the morning. Peter Siudo threw his glass against the grandfather clock, sending shards flying across the room. He promised himself he wouldn't let drinking become a habit, but desperate times called for desperate measures, no matter how many cups he hurled. It wouldn't stop the progression of time, it would not delay his departure, slated for just three hours into the future. Siudo took a deep breath summoning a belt from deep inside him and stumbled to his feet careful to avoid the broken glass Siuda stopped at his kitchen table where a map of the Far East had just been draped over it like a tablecloth just looking at the ad made him sick or maybe that was a hangover to be regardless he felt like buking there was so much more to Russia than what he saw and he had seen a lot pretender kings and corporate republics citing or cities of art and the Red Army military zone he had ventured across the entire political speed spectrum just in his own little slice of Russia he was familiar with surface level knowledge of the warlord's disease he knew the Tsar the twin Vaz the goat and the greatest enemy and he was even familiar with the one called the father a religious type who sought to synchronize a church with anarchism the mere thought of it compounded his already miserable headache he didn't even want to think about what was to of course the West Siuda so slumped down in his chair and started absentmindedly at the map. Rozhevsk, huh? Certainly not a humble man. It wasn't just a fascist. Siuda began to realize there was no faction of the people in the east. He readjusted his posture and swiped a pen off the adjacent counter, and then cro again crossing off states between monarchist fascists and statists. It began to settle in for Siuda just how miserable life was in the east. He stood, forced into sobriety, and began to pace back and forth. The old Siuda had returned, the man who had spent the rest of the morning plotting out just how he would turn the region around. He took his pen and circled Rozhevsk, the first target. Now, I did ask you guys yesterday whether we should go with something we can all agree upon. An unspeakable evil again. Or pull the rope taut. And overall, there, at the time of this recording, more support for... Pull the rope taut. The fascists of Magadan are far from pure good heart in any sense of the term. Now, as the people of the port city starved and froze in the streets, the fascists sat upon their mountain of riches and American funding. No more will the justice or the people of Magadan suffer under this injustice. And it ever drew out the fascists and restore power to the people. We must redistribute the arms imported from America and ensure that all within the port city are aware of the misdeeds done to them by the fascists of years past. Reminding them that those years are past and the best is yet to begin. They'll only bring the city onto the side of Ceuta. Also, the time is recording. Now, I ask you guys as well whether we should remember the tyrant. We should have a Black October, or the Opiate of the Masses. And overall, there's, right now, more support for, as well, Remember the Tyrant, because we don't like tyrants here. Throughout the ways of the Far East, you can ask any opponent of authoritarianism as to who Genrik Yagoda was, and they will tell you of the remnants of the Far Eastern Soviet Social Republic of years past. They will tell you of the theocratic measures implemented without end in sight. They will tell you the NKVD kicking down doors in the night, all in the name of a doomed nation. They will tell you the Siberian against the Central well, Siberian War against the CSR, doing nothing but wearing both nations down to nothing and devastating the birthplace of Siberian anarchism. Then why do the people of Irkutsk continue to think of the madman fondly? It is something of a mystery that is without question, though now is not the time to ponder why some may idolize a tyrant so much as it is to strike those memories down. Those who do not remember the worst excesses of the NKVD will be shown how horrific Yugoda's reign was, whether or whether or not they want to hear it. So right now, we still, of course, have to uh, basically beat uh, the other dude here. was a Valentine stepping off, uh, stepping off here. We have nine versus five, so we have a majority here, but we need more political power, which we have none. We're getting more every single day, which is nice, but we still have to integrate a lot of places, which is going to take forever to do, which does suck. So we can close out of that one, close out of this one, and we will be making more divisions as time goes on, just because we're going to need more divisions. More fully combat with divisions, please, please, please. I'm um, going to do that one as well. Thank you. We make two, make four, even though we are making some money, but they're less. They're, let their people return. Peter, Evgenia Tartuto spoke softly. I understand why you're, where you're coming from, but it's not too late. I want you to reconsider this. The morning was off to a great start. They spent their first night in their temporary HQ in the form of Rozhev's bickering, and the first morning standing out of the entrance of the city shivering. I've made up my mind, Evgenia. I made all these arrangements as you slept last night. The vehicles are already in transit. Siuda stood with his arms crossed, facing the winding path that led into the woods, and out of what was known as Rozhev's, Evgenia sighted in defeat. It's not that he was purposely ignoring her advice, he just knew he was right. There had to be some sort of return to normalcy in the city to wash away the stain for good. The distinct or distant hum of the engines brought both of them to attention. There was no going back now. And after this was over, Siuda promised he would never let Yevgenia live down her worrying over nothing soon. The hum turned to a rumble, and buses revealed themselves to the world, finally. The first bus came to stop meters away from them both. Siuda made his way to the door, and waited as people began to step off, suitcases in tow. Welcome, comrades, welcome home! The fascist regime had displaced and deported hundreds of Jewish and native people from the lands that had been in their families for generations. This wouldn't do for Petor. 
A bald man was the last off the bus. Uh, walking down the steps slowly and deliberately, his thick rectangular suitcase overflowing with his belongings, Siodo moved to help him, but the bald man stopped him. You're the one who brought us here, aren't you? Siodo only nodded. The bald man gripped Siodo's hands tightly, and Siodo got to fully observe the man, his patchy skin and scruffy face. The man stared deep into his eyes. Thank you. This place is my home. I'll feel safe again. With a smile, the man walked into the city, disappearing into the crowd. The project was sure to be a success. Nice. Oh, wait. Wait, what? It increases Stepanov's influence in a moor. Well, that's not good. Well, we want more Siudas, right? Not in a moor. Magadan, a moor. Well, that's not good. Well, I guess we're done with that one, then. Black Army Reinforcements. When f wait. Effects in 18 days. When we fail it... We get political power. We'll fail if you have at least... No. Huh? If I screw this up, I'll keep doing this off screen anyways. Will fail when failed. Two in a more Toguro Chumikansky and Magadan. Alright then. Amur. By the people, for the people. Magadan was always a bit out of the way, even for a Siberian city, and this time of year it was certainly frigid. Peter Siodo wouldn't have found himself here under any normal circumstances, but he was in the area, and the world had gone up that an American cargo ship had just come in a day ago, and recently after the liberation of the city. Stepping down paved roads and towards the docks, an elected officer by the name of the Brukar, Buark, shouted Siodo. His men had been watching the cargo ship that had docked itself on one of Magadan's jetties. By a ramp leading to the deck of the ship itself, a pair of soldiers stood next to what Siodo could only assume was captain of the cargo the ship. He looked up as Siodo approached, and even looked a little relieved to see him. Finally, the captain grumbled in a thick accent. Are you in charge? Should I get a translator? Siodo stopped in front of him immediately. He spoke. Translator? No, no, no. No need, he said. English. English. Tenuous. The captain blinked, bushy brows furrowing together. Well, all right. We've got foodstuffs, warm clothes, lots of supplies for the winter here, he explained. While Siodo nodded along, Pietro saw a glance with Burak. Trying to hide a mischievous smile that began to creep onto his face, Siodo whispered to the young officer, murmuring in order. And just like that, Burak... Well, Barak peeled off, starting to marshal his men. The captain watched the soldiers in dark uniforms started to march by. Suffice to say, the captain grew more than a little suspicious. His eyes narrowed. You are... you are the... So you would have cut him off, yes, he responded, not even giving the captain a chance to respond. The American looked over his shoulders as soldiers started to swarm the deck of his ships, working together to lift boxes and cart them down towards a forming crowd. The captain looked as if he was about to protest. The soldiers broke open the crates and tossed the goods inside to beckoning civilians. Looking back at the suit, his face and the guilty smile wrought upon it, the captain concluded one thing. I don't get it paid enough for this? Pretty much. Is there anything she can't do? Of all the, those lords of Siuda, Yevgenia Tartuta has been a mentor for countless years past and hasn't had her loyalty waver over the past years of advancement for the anarchist cause, however. As we look to the further secure the communes, it has become clear that we will need someone with a special skill set to persuade the peoples of Siberia with their experience and skills as a writer. Tartuta might prove invaluable in this ever present power struggle. Being the skilled writer that she is, it would be far from a challenge to write a child's book on the dreams or adventures of a character fighting for the dreams of anarchism in a fantasy world against the vile dragon who would want otherwise for the people of Russia. In due time, this piece will surely become bestseller, a malignant cancer. The night after the first day of the return on project, as Siuda had taken to calling it, ended like any other. Siuda ate, revised his speeches, and took a moment to enjoy a pleasant conversation with Taratuta. Her gut feeling about the project never quite went away, quite, quite went away, but she did her best to push her idea from her head. Siuda dropped his pen triumphantly and glanced over his speech once more. He had taken to writing them at the behest of a record keeper he met in Novosibirsk, important fragments of history as she called them. Yevgenia, come look, this will be an excellent way to kick off our anti-fascist campaign. Yevgenia sauntered over to Siuda and plucked the paper from his, from his hands. This community is healing, she, said, she read over her glasses. Returning refugees is her medicine and tolerance is a cure. Tertuta made a face, raising her eyebrows. Since when did you become a doctor? Pietro rolled his eyes as he sipped from his teeth. It's good, she acquiesced. Might make someone cry. The pleasant conversation was cut short by a ferocious beating on the door of the two occupants of the Infro's house, watching the door intently, just waiting for it to fly open, but it didn't. There came no more knocks, no more sounds at all. The two looked at each other, making conversation without a word. Slowly, Siuda rose from his seat and crept his way to the door. He didn't have a gun, but Tartuta kept her pistol close to her side. Siuda took a deep breath and threw open the door abruptly. No one was there. At the doorstep, however, was a note. Peter snatched it from the ground and slammed the door in one fluid motion. Tartuta watched as Siuda scanned over the paper, eyes moving frantically from word to word as though he had to keep track of them or else they would envelop him. After an eternity of silence, Siuda turned to face the Evgenia brow, furrowed in confusion. They're just names. They're just lists, lists of names. But Siuda paused. Some of the names are crossed out. Siuda read and reread the document again and again until he committed to the memory. He clicked with him then. Yeah, these names, these are the people we brought in this morning. The cave. Also, how are we doing? That uh, stuff is okay, see? But... Almost 2 billion, not bad. 
Um, 90%. Pretty darn nice. Now, oh, utilize socialist populism, huh? Hmm. Oh, now we're at 11 out of 3. That's actually pretty nice. But the cave. Stepping up to the podium on a stage in the middle of Irkutsk, Siota glanced upon a wary crowd that was still forming. Passing workers, men and women alike, some with children in hand, started to cluster up to be in earshot of Siota's microphone. He wasn't nervous. Piotr had done this many times before, but he couldn't remember the last time the crowd in a place like Ansk was so dour. In the months since the liberation of Irkutsk, the city had undergone changes under the communes. Ripping out of the ugly facets of Yagoda police state took time, the instability grown rife as the local administration hammered out the kinks. Gripping the edge of the podium, Siota cleared his throat and held his head high as he began to speak. Comrades of Irkutsk! Siota's voice boomed. It had been some months since the city had been liberated from the clutches of the old Union's withering hands and the presidium toppled. A tyrant Yagoda, Mussolini painted red, who would have seen you all monitored and controlled like obedient slaves by his NKVD, has been cast down and justly punished for his crimes now more than never. The future of Irkutsk looks ever brighter. Siota's voice had all the charisma, the fiery quality that inspired rousing cheers all over the Angarsk river basin, but that day it fell into fears. As his eyes scanned the crowd, faces twisted into sneers, frowns were even worse yet. Remain blank expressions as if they weren't listening at all. Siota, Gulped. Perhaps they were too used to Yagoda's iron fists, like cattle or men in the cave, who had seen only the shadows. Siota could blame them, but something deep down within him, something etched behind those weary faces, told him that it wasn't their fault, as much as it turned his stomach to admit it. Yagoda's regime brought security that the Black Army had it, not yet, although it would. Easing it back, Siota felt his chest empty of breath. The fiery plan for his speech dissipated. He didn't know what to say next. Taking a deep breath, he glanced upon the crowd again. And we'll have more town halls to discuss and remedy issues you've been seeing in the city. Nice. 12 to 2. Honestly, with that, it's so good there. Um, Where's this one? Ruda and Amur. We need Tuva and Barnal. Honestly, 12 to 2. Um, Much order can be maintained. Honestly, we're doing so well. I'm going to risk this and let's go to Amur uh, and Magadan. We're going to hurt GP growth, but a growth will increase by 0.10. Oh, God, that's not, that's actually not very good. Oh. But yeah, now, a couple comments as well, but we got a lot of things to read still, so. A Russia for all of us. There's nothing dedicated to freedom, nothing quite so devoted to the liberation of mankind as anarchism. From Kamchatka to the borders of the West Siberian Plain, anarchism reigns supreme. As Stepanov's power grab is shown to be nothing but a total blunder, it's become clear that anarchism no longer faces internal challenges of any kind. Having passed its first test, anarchism now stands legitimized, powerful, and above all, unstoppable. All that stands in the way now is to unify the half of Russia left independent from Germany's steel grip and to go even further beyond. It'll be a long, hard fight, but anarchism will persevere. Such is an inevitability. Nice, so good. Taming the wild beast. Hold up, please calm yourselves. Siota stood atop a hastily constructed stage of wooden boxes in the center of the city. A crowd that teetered on a mob had amassed around, and the thing about people is that when enough of them get together, they form one body. A crowd is a separate species from a human in a way that moves and operates. The beast before him roared out loudly, demanding answers. Siota ran a hand through his hair. Jesus. Enough, he commanded, and the crowd fell silent. What happened last night was a tragedy, but if we can fight between ourselves, we'll obtain justice. A tragedy, shouted the beast. Thirty people were killed. The beast raged. You brought us here. You led us to be slaughtered. The fascists aren't gone, and we aren't safe. The beast repeated the mantra again and again, drowning at Siuda, and the futile attempts to tame the creature. The two threatened to tear each other apart until a gunshot rang out through the town, silencing them both. At the tall of the tail of the beast, the middle-aged man of average height and build stood ramrod straight, and his weapon pointed high into the air. Come on, Siuda, I apologize for having to use such methods to get your attention, but I feel that what I will say is important to warrant it. The man stepped forward, the beast disassembling around him as he moved effortlessly through the crowd. I was born here, but was forced to into exile during the dictatorship as both my father uh, as both my father was Jewish. Or fathers? Huh. My family fled all the way to Novosibirsk, to the city of promise, the oasis of Siberia. That was when I first heard your ideals and became a devoted follower. What has always impressed me, and what has surely brought you from the city to here, is your ability to foster unity. The man stepped closer to the stage and offered a hand to Siuda. I go by... Abakumov. I want to help you find whoever did this. And one by one, others from the crowd joined him. Alright, so now we'll fail if we don't have that. If we fit. Okay, cool. And honestly, do we not have it already? Cheetah has two divisions, right? Yeah, they have two right there. We got two right there, and we got more than enough right there, so we'll fail of at least two divisions in Cheetah. Ulan, oh, uh, Ulan Uda. Okay, Cheetah, Ulan Uda. Cheetah, Ulan Uda. Taksimo. Cheetah. Hmm. Cheetah, Ulan Uda. Ulan Uda, Cheetah, so boom boom. Okay. There you go. That should be okay, alright? Is there anything she can't do? Pirate is looking not too bad though. I love it. 
as uh, they're still trying to rapidly and rapidly improve. And if you want to about better, even better army professionals, please go ahead. That's pretty good, honestly. The next level, so we went from widespread cronyism with political interference. So we lose political power, get more organization, better supply consumption, more air and attack and defense, more attack and defense, less planning speed, but more, more planning. That's actually not too bad. We're in political interference. Um, getting a professional army would be really good, though. Hey, but I'd rather be where we're at right now than not where we're at. So, a modern retelling. Description. Though she never had any of her own, Tara Tuta had always had a soft spot for children in her eyes. More people ought to act like children. Optimistic and curious, but above all else, hopeful. She saw that hope in her, the eyes of the children that had formed a semicircle around her. The Tom's Public Library had graciously accepted her offer to showcase her proudest achievement, a children's book. The city had been scarred by the reaction to peaceful demonstrators ordered by Stepanov, but the joy of children could heal any wound. Okay, children, a slender woman's chipper voice bringing the children to order. Today we have a very special guest reader, Comrade Taratuta. What do we say to her? Of course, the children responded with a thousand different answers, ranging from greetings to expressing their desire to go to the bathroom. The woman smiled at Taratuta, rolling her eyes. Okay, okay, let's calm back down. We're going to be very quiet and very respectful while she reads, okay? Various indications of agreement came from the horde of children. With that, she opened her storybook and flipped to the first page. There once was a mouse named Gregory. Every day he woke up and he made his way to school. Mice don't go to school, one child cried. i never seen a mouse go to school. Tara took a smile through the interruption. Only a child would see the need to correct a fantasy. Ah, but this world is where they do. The response seemed to placate the child, and Tartuta was free to continue. One day, while on the playground, Gregory had bumped into Fyodor, a huge dragon, who used to who used her size to bully all the other school children. Give me your lunch, little mouse, Fyodor thundered. Gregory was scared. Uh, oh, Gregory, or Georgi. Uh, Theodore could swallow him whole. Georgi reached into his backpack to hand over his lunch when another student ran up beside him. Tartuta licked her finger, turning the still stuck pages together. Or still stuck together pages. A girl he knew from class ran to Georgi's side. Stop, she said. Why does she deserve your lunch? That's yours. The girl turned to Theodore, standing at the foot of the dragon. Just because you're stronger doesn't mean you get to push us around. The student attracted the attention of many of the other school children who joined her, standing up beside her. You may be able to pick on us alone, but together we are stronger than you. Tara to gently close the bug and smile back at the children. Their smiling faces was a reward at uh, all she needed. Uh, yeah, the smiling reward was all she needed. My bad. Oh my gosh, I just butchered that so hard. Where's Tomsk? There it is. That's really, that's not bad. Maybe the humanists. I kind of want to do that, but at the same time, we need core more stuff, man. We really do. Uh, Cheetah. A fork in the road. One week and two days after Pyotr Siuda and Yevgenia Tartuta first arrived in Rozhevsk, the town had been turned completely upside down. The process of denazification had become an obsession to Siuda, and even his worst enemies could credit him for being a man of firm ideological conviction. The desire to blot out the last remnant of Russian fascism consumed him. The trip to Rozhevsk was only meant to last five days before he was set to travel to other parts of the east, but the days blended together. As the townspeople he had taken under his wing grew more and more paranoid that at any moment the killer or killers could strike again. Abba Kumov had made a name for himself as a town's sheriff, though he renounced the title. He was able to effectively bridge the gap between the population who still held Siuda in high regard and those who saw him to blame. Abba Kumov, under the advice of Siuda, formed the Emergency Anti-Fascist Committee, a board of five individuals, none of which were uh, Siuda. For once, he found himself in the crowd rather than in the assembly. Tartuta, however, had been chosen and essentially acted as his voice on the committee. The committee had been planning for days, strategizing for defense and helping dead, uh, dead end leads. Though Siuda desperately wanted to help, the popular was will was against him here. Despite his best intentions, he could only watch helplessly as his neighbor began to accuse neighbor of being of the ghost of Rajevsky, as the terrorists had become known. While preparing for yet another day of the committee hearing, Siuda received a transmission over the radio. Comrade Siuda came the relief voice. This is General Valentiv. I'm in Rakutsk or what will be left of it. Entire army units have split into factions. The military apparatus of governments is completely crippled. Moreover, some of the Union bureaucrats have taken this opportunity to attempt to regain the power through subverting our systems and popular resistance. I can't do anything. The situation is completely out of control here. If we lose control of the power supply here, we could be without electricity in major cities. We need you out here urgently. Siuda sat by the radio to send silence. No matter what he chose, the answer would be wrong. The committee has a control here under the situation. Has the situation under control. I can't remove the influence of fascism from this day and I won't leave until I do. Um, as much as I want to stay there, uh, the committee has control. Give him control. We'll be fine. Just a second. Oh no. Or just for fun. Oh. Nice. Very nice. The growth is not very good, but whatever. So many core that stuff too. Of course, we're doing this as well, so 
Eh, we'll see. Time's up. The months-long struggle for the influence of the recently integrated Far Eastern Commons has at long last come to a close. Both opponents have reconvened at the ring, equipped with all the power, sway, and support at their disposal. While the Far East falls silent, subsumed into the ever-expanding free territory, the drums of war beat loudly in their home. Now there's nothing left to do but wait and wait and see if their efforts will be all in vain. In the end, the boy orator of Kants came out on top. Sensory overload. It had not been two minutes, and Stepanov already rarely began to hyperventilate. As closing uniforms had melted into one towering mountain, as that if his pudgy hands could climb, they would let him look down at them and then up in the river, uh, down and up and down and up and down and up and, and what he saw. Or, or no. Or, he would let him see clean across the girls. Were his hands really that pudgy? Yeah, he saw him up and down, my bad. He looked down at them and up in the mirror and down and up and down and up and down and up and he saw a caged animal confined behind an ever-shrinking cage. He screamed, a blood-curling plea for his life that one could never imagine originated from the scheming general. A man of poise rendered helpless as he fought for the clothes to get in the effing bag. They wouldn't. Frustrated as a child is after hours of attempting to pound a square toy through a round hole, Stepanov felt tears well in his eyes and as he went to wipe away the moisture he caught a glimpse of his pudgy hand and his blood pressure soared. He plopped helplessly on the magnificent bed stolen from the York Kid Palace, stolen like everything else he had. And he saw, from his bedroom balcony, he could see them all, their faces, that rage he instilled in them through his actions. General Ivan Stepanov had been reduced to a blubbering mess, and it couldn't get any worse. The shrill scream of the phone temporarily snapped Stepanov out of his emotions. The phone, his lifeline to the outside world, rang off the hook, and for once in his life he was relieved to hear it. Stepanov sniffled, wiped his eyes, and ripped the phone off the receiver. They're here, he cried. They're here, Suda, and the thousands of them. I know why they're here. They've come to kill me. Stepanov panted heavily, waiting lifetimes. He didn't have for the voice at the other end to tell him it would be okay. And when the voice came, and it was the secretary, just calling to remind him that she would be on leave, visiting family, Stepanov reacted violently, throwing the phone back into its cradle. Stepanov shambled to the window, where he saw he was surrounded. No scheme, no plan. The game wasn't fun anymore. Russia wasn't worth it. He would resign, give up, fold, whatever. But it wouldn't be enough to satiate the hungry mob he'd weaponize against countless others. Stepanov took a deep breath, gently unpacked his escape bag, and sat on his bag, facing the door, ready to receive the prize he'd earned. Here lies a king smothered by his own house of cards. Nice. Anarchichesky Soviet becomes ruling party. Nice. And we get the actual focus read. More drastic measures. It's increasingly becoming obvious that if we wish to survive in this bleak world, we must acquire nuclear weapons. The free territory is a mighty land, and our people are full of heart and courage, but no amount of courage, weapon, or men will, be st will stop a barrage of nuclear weapons. Their terrible strength is unparalleled, only the strongest nations currently possess them. The only way to ensure such weapons are never used against us is to match theirs with our own. If we can manage that, we will secure the independence and safety of our communes. Cool. There's a lot of people do a lot of stuff here, so... But off I go. Ciuta stood, uh, arms crossed, looking out over the city, thousands of kilometers away to the east. Yevgenia and the town of Rodzievsk fought their own little battle. And despite a desire to sleep, he couldn't make, shake the feeling that what he was doing was wrong. He was never one to start a project and not finish it, and now wouldn't be a good time to start. Even with that in mind, what else was he supposed to do? Sit idly by? A good anarchist always respects people's will, and the people chose to be rid of him. Arkus creaked, that's what he first noticed, as Ciuta made his way down the main avenue. Accompanied by his recently increased security, he finally saw what most of them did when they pictured anarchy. Shattered glass peppered up the streets, fires raged inside of buildings, and it was evident that the sanitation system had been completely abandoned. Unnerving, but not necessarily damning. Ciuta had been to actual war zones where battles were being actively fought, and the urban decay hardly came close. Ciuta stopped at the gate to the Varsidium. Before he and Stepanov set out east, scattered like the dust in the wind, Ciuta had already des designated many landmarks as possible prime locations for local assemblies. The Presidium was a crown jewel of a mall with an assembly there. It will be clear that the Soviet system had been usurped by that of the anarchists. Ciuta knocked twice on the door, paused, and then once more, on cue the do door swung open, and Ciuta and his guard were ushered inside. The Presidium was far from the jewel promise. The windows had been boarded up. The entire wings of the building had been repurposed to house people. The many rows of tables once occupied by the Union elite were filled by three men and two women, whose quiet discussion died out as the door closed. General Valentiev, surely a sight for the sore eyes, rounded a corner just in time to come face to face with Ciuta. Comrade, he exclaimed, I didn't expect your arrival this early, but I'm glad you're here. We've got a lot of work to do. The second test. The anarchists have won. Though our nation was close to becoming the kind of despotic warlord state that many of our neighbors have become, Sipetia Ciuta and supporters managed to organize and beat back Stepanov's vile coup. With Stepanov out of the picture, a new dawn opens from the, for the Siberian Free Territory. <clears throat> Where we go on from here and what Ciuta does with his newfound power on the Security Council is unknown, but we can only hope that he sticks the anarchist ideals that have brought us here together. Nice. Awesome. 22.8%, 83.4, not bad, not bad. So once we get rid of the, all that debt as much as possible, then we're going to really just increase the GDP like crazy. Even though this is going to hurt us pretty badly here. Yeah. Because that, that immediately hurts us. Maybe, maybe not. But whatever. Cool. Um, it doesn't look like we can do anything else here, so. Cool. 
And to prepare for the motherland will happen in 71, 69, 71, 71, wow. A campaign of hearts and minds. The cause of the predicament the city of Arkusk found themselves in th was threefold. Firstly, the Black Army had splintered into two different factions. As Siud had heard, they'd done in Tomsk as well. This was a non start. If the armed forces could not effectively fulfill their duty to uphold the common order and protect the community, anarchism would never get off the ground. Secondly, the lack of a political foundation, partially caused by Siud's trip to Rajevsk, meant that the educated elite were able to manipulate the people into simply democratically electing uh, to restore the Supreme Soviet. Finally, the people just didn't care. Sounds pretty normal. You're on blocks A, B, and D, so you'd have commanded a bustling army of soldiers, civilians, and slackers. Remember, we're working with limited resources. Uh, food, ration food carefully, but without being frugal. As people swarmed all around him, sectioned off into rows that had best suited their talents, so you could only watch as a stupid grin crept around his face. A night's worth of planning had turned the survivors to community leaders. After some time, the relief effort began to run itself. Food was delivered on time, repairs were conducted all throughout the day, and the workers of the sanitation system returned to their essential duties. So had crept out through one of the many doors and elected to take a look around the city. It already began to show the signs of improvement. Beneath the rubble of that and the carnage, Suda could start to see it as a Paris for which it was. One problem down, two to go. We still have envelopes here? And Irkutsk, four divisions. Oopsie. Oopsie. So this here is Irkutsk. All right. Everyone, let's all have a good old time in Irkutsk. An unfortunate reality. You psychopath. You moron. You, you absolutely effing idiot. Valentine struggles to find the words to describe Anadroni Mishrenko, slamming a fist on the desk of Comrade Siuda in frustration. Pietro, you've got to recognize this for what it is. Suicide. Pietro Siuda felt he could trust Comrade Valentine. He had always done in the best interest of the people. Of course, he thought the same of Ivan Stepanov. Comrades, you and I have both fought for Comrade Mishrenko's right to speak and propose his plans to the assembly. Valentine brushed back his hair and leaned back into his chair in disbelief. Mishrenko sat erect. Uh, his lips curled in a smile. Thank you, Comrade Siuda. I appreciate that you can recognize true talent when you see it. Mr. Rankel shifted his seat, leaning in towards Pieter. From my service, I have learned that the intellectuals, they are excellent at throwing in, or sitting in ivory towers, shouting commands down to us. They know nothing of practical warfare. A nuclear weapon is a device, or a weapon just like a rifle or pistol. We don't ask a scientist to assemble our artillery, we ask people. Pieter, not everything is a people's struggle, Valentine pleaded. I implore you to leave this to the experts for the sake of the people. The academia are comrades too. Not everything may be the people's struggle, but this is. Um, I'm not really sure which one I want. The academia are our comrades too, but that's true. Not everything may be the people's struggle, but I think this is. We got some more comments to go through, but there's a lot of stuff to read still. As we have a lot of coffee, lots and lots and lots and lots of coffee. We failed. Now we'll oh, if we fail if. Oh, wait. Does it even matter? We already got rid of him. All good things? Siuda woke up alone. Not just in his bed, but the entire presidium which had become his home away from home, away from home, if you counted his residence in Rajevsk. From one end of the building to the other, Siuda was truly alone. As he wandered between the twisting hallways, it made him long for Yevgenia. He always knew what to do, even when he could not find it within himself to believe he could do what was right for Russia. She always could. Siuda could only wish for the best of his friend and wonder what she was up to. The question would have to wait. When Siuda finally returned to the main hall, he heard the first indication of life and peeked out of the window to get a handle on the situation before having to face it himself. The city center was split into six roads, which coalesced at a fountain in the middle. Endless rows of people lined each street, carrying signs, children, and weapons. Siuda squinted to get a better view of the different groups. The kaleidoscope of ideologies branching out into the circle ranged from easily identifiable followers of the Begoda, so waving the banner of the Union to those supporting ideologies Siuda wasn't even sure he could define. This situation was untenable, and when the hard work done to repair the city would be for nothing if it tore itself apart again. Everyone in Irkutsk had gathered in the small section of the town, necessitating Siuda to force his way to the front. Finally, at the fountain, it became clear what was going on. Representatives of the six factions had met to lay out their demands. One of the representatives saw Siuda and sprung from his seat, jogging over to him. You, you're Pietro Siuda. Pietro Siuda. The man swung an arm around him. You're just in time. You can save this. Siuda wasn't quite sure what he was supposed to be saving, but the brewing conflict didn't seem appealing to him at all in the slightest. Coincidentally, Siuda made contact, eye contact with General Valentiv as he too fought his way up to the belly of the beast. Mouth a plea for Valentiv to call for armed support. Oh. Uh, okay. Baratia, yes. Alright, well. Well, they can never take away from us. 
Stepanov want, went to great lengths to muddy the waters on what is anarchism and what isn't. The sweeping authoritarian decrees and actions made our citizens question what anarchism even is. The situation was made worse by the fact that most citizens didn't and still don't know what anarchism actually is. Our guiding hand, Pietro Siuda, will make a speech outlining the basic fundamental rights of man and the core tenets of anarchism, hopefully sparking a discussion on the ideology and helping our citizens to understand what their rights are in the free territory. And I'll read the next one immediately, too. I'll get into this one. We have recruited scientists of oh, the previous regimes. Oh! Scrunch your blueprints. Democracy, unfortunately, give them all they need. All hands on deck. No, oh, we did get one. <laughs> all hands on deck. Let's struggle for nuclear weapons one against the state itself. The crusade we are to embark on is one, is one against elitism and controlling nature that is the state often imposes on citizens. The free territory embodies everything that the governments and states around us are not, with true freedom and liberty for its constituent parts. Thus, if we are to embark on the development of nuclear technology and weaponry, we must do so as a whole, drawing experience from all the communes and giving everyone a chance to contribute. We'll go from commune to commune and ask for men and women who want to assist in the anarchist struggle for nuclear weapons. Scavenging the ruins, though. Somewhere deep in the woodlands of Siberia, Pietro Suida, oh, uh, Suida, Siuda, wandered, he trembled, his naked body recoiling against the falling snow, he was stripped off of all of his possessions, save for a singular lantern, radiating a dim light. Above him, a pale white eye watched from a black starless sky without direction or purpose, Pietro stumbled forwards. The forlorn forest swayed in the frigid wind, but Pietro's hair remained still. The air sung a song, a call, it was inviting. It felt like home, it felt good, the shaking stopped, suddenly he existed outside of the elements. Snowflakes made their home on his skin, refusing to melt. This was good. He laughed as he dropped the lantern. Pietro kicked snow into the air and danced around as the ice crystals fell to the ground ever so delicately. He spun and twisted and jumped, frolicking deeper and deeper into the woods. The song of the forest grew louder and louder as Pietro's grin grew larger and larger. The song stopped, the great celestial body watching over and blinked out of existence. The forest was now black. It was more than black. It was a void. It wasn't simply a room with dull light. It was this destroyer of light. Pietro's laughing trailed off as the cold impacted him once more for years. Pietro stood in the destroyer of light without warning. The trees ignited into flame. Pietro began to scream. He began to claw out his skin. It was so hot. So hot. It's hot. Pietro began to melt his skin, pulling at the ground. It was hot. Hot, 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 hot. From the ashen corpse of the woods, a singular tree grew and on its lone branch dangled a body, fat and round. The body shook amongst the flicking flames. Pieter, the corpse thundered, you child, look at what you've brought to the forest, teeming with life. Now look, look. Pieter had no eyes but to, to look what he saw. Pieter jerked himself upright in his bed, panting heavily. He looked around his room as it was before he closed his eyes. He began to laugh. It was only a dream. His giggle turned into a laugh and his laugh into a sob. Another sleepless night. Inflation's getting way too high though for our liking. Our real growth is really bad though, holy crap. We actually might do a tax cup eventually, but at the negotiating table, Cedar looked at Valentine, and then to the hordes of protesters that had formed the walls around him. The last thing this powder keg needed was a Spock. Cedar shrugged and smiled at the man. What can I help you with? Ciuda had come to know the names of the six representatives rather quickly. Each group wanted something of the other, as is only natural during negotiations, with Ciuda acting as a mediator. As the chants from the people grew louder all around him, the six men struggled to iron out a deal that left everyone happy and, and the city intact. Well, that's the point of the assembly, Ciuda explained, running off of minimal sleep and diminishing hope. Each person gets one vote. If you if you turn out, your vote will count. Simple as that. There's no way to maintain a system of anarchism with parties. Debate. Uh, erupted as the six men stumbled over the top of each other to prove why the statement was true. Whatever they were trying to accomplish, it clearly wasn't working. So you had to massage his temples intensely, trying to work out the migraine that grew and grew. The stomping of the feet and constantly repeating chants made Ciudad yearn for the black army to simply intervene. We could have passed and let all six protest groups march as they chose and everyone could go home. Three hours, of course, had passed. But then the chants had died out, and now the negotiations were more than an exhibit, or rather an inverted zoo. Six crowds, six beasts, stood around the seven humans and watched as they murmured and mumbled. Finally, one of them stepped back, resigning from the endurance test that they had undertaken. Eight minutes later, another one did two, and one more, and two more, and then it was just Ciudad and one other. You made your point clear on politics, and it is apparent your mind will never change and your opinions won't budge. That's fine, said the last standing one. I cannot, though, allow your economic policies to drive the city and rush at large into the ground. There must be some compromise here, or there will be no choice but to organize a general strike. Ciudad, exhausted and eager to return home, learned an important lesson. Sometimes you just gotta say yes. Let's see what else. Well, what else we do this? Um, would that help improve uh, growth at all? Not really. Here. That didn't help out that much at all. But growth, I'm a little worried about growth. Honestly, this is hurting our growth a lot. Our GDP growth will increase by 0.01%, but daily physical power gain, weekly stability goes down, gr GDP growth goes down by 0.5. That's a bit extreme, man. Speaking to a shaken people, you're caught. 
Comrade Siuda, Yevgenia draped Peter in a coat uh, of bare skin, one far too large for the man of his stature. The revolutionary looked straight on, his mind's elsewhere, of course. Yevgenia circled from his back and stood in front of him. She strained to find Peter inside of his eyes. Uh, <clears throat> her face dropped. Peter, I understand you're torn. She placed her wrinkled hands on his chest. We've come too far now. You have to spend. speak to them. I know you well. You always do the right thing, Peter. You aren't him. The phrase struck a chord with Peter, his face twitching slightly. Thank you, Comrade Tartuto. Peter pulled the coat tighter and tighter around himself as he moved to the door to the balcony. He gripped the doorknob before even stepping out. He could hear the cheers. They sung his name, demanding to see Comrade Siuda, defender of the revolution against the snake general Stepanov. Peter took in a deep breath, turned to the knob, and stepped out into the brisk morning air. Peter nodded politely as he waited for the roaring applause to end. It felt different. This was a treatment fast received and Sars envied. Why was it here? The answer was is in the ad admiration of the people below him. They chose him, they trusted him. Peter was not to let them down. Comrades, he called. Today we pass a second test. With a combined might, we've toppled the authoritarian states of Siberia. We've left them battered and bruised, yet we must remain vigilant. It is time to build up our own anarchy, free from the state inside and out of our territory. P Peter found his footing, continuing to rally the people to his side as he laid out the core message of the anarchist movement. If only for a moment the weight of the fear lifted from his shoulders. There's too much work ahead of us. General Assembly, is there anything else we can do there? Nope. It's still in 1970. Reunification hurt us really badly with all that bad growth. Oh my goodness. 0.16% growth. Oh boy, that's not good. But, Super Sleuth Siuda. A strict curfew would have been forced since the attacks. Rajetsk was a city under lockdown for good reason, of course. Abba Kumov wasn't taking any chances for that. He was commendable. His first mistake, though, was trying to force an anarchist to abide by the rules. Siuda slipped out of the door and into the dead of night with nothing more than his fur coat wrapped around him. He wasn't even sure what he was ho hoping to find. A clue? Footprints? A giant neon sign pointing towards an individual or group of behind the attacks? And he would have been nice and said Siuda got a freezing rain and pitched Black City. This was stupid! He decided... Come on! He turned on his heel, looking back to the trail he'd made, and tried to fit his foot in perfectly into the holes. Well, he couldn't fit in. When he couldn't fit into the first hole, he had paid it no mind. When the second didn't, it was cause for suspicion. When Suda looked up and saw the footprints that led the opposite way from which he came, he knew. Suda crept to the outskirts of the city, towards the tall trees that, that the buses, those darn buses, had entered from. The footsteps led further north, and Suda followed closely behind like a loyal dog without explanation. The footsteps stopped. There simply were holes, and then there were not. Suda inched closer to investigate, and as he did, he heard the most peculiar sound. The ground beneath him meowed. Suda shook his head. Clearly, he had lost the plot. Men didn't vanish, leaving nothing but footsteps behind him, and the ground did not meow. Suda, or Suda, shifted his weight to make his way back to his residence when he heard it again. No meow. Suda furrowed his brow and looked all around him, but no source could be found. He stepped and heard it again. Suda's eyes became uh, wide with the realization a cat could be buried in the snow. He began frantically wiping away the thick layers of snow until he found it. Not a cat, but a door. A disdain for tyrants. Not bad, more defensive than nice. Our communal spirit is pretty good, too. Our attachment to liberty. Um, that's not bad, too. Well, if we wish to remain a free people in the free territories, we must be prepared to deal with those who would take away our freedoms, for there are numerous. Warlords on every border seek to oppress us, for there are none like us, and beyond them lie even greater threats in Germany and Japan, whose terrible might can be seen in Moscow and Beijing today. Every man and woman should be prepared to take up arms in defense of our way of life, should the situation demand it, for should they not, we will surely be lost. Exercising the ghost of Rajevsky, Bitter Suida, Yevgenia Tarduta, Abag... Abba Kumov and other members of the emergency anti-fascist committee gather around a circle on the outskirts of the town. Tartu the shot see with a skeptical glance. Peter, if you want to return back to Kansk, I'm sure that. No, he insisted. I'm telling you, I was out late last night and I heard the meowing like as if there was a cat right beneath my feet. The members of the committee exchanged glances that conveyed emotion between the concern and frustration. I know it sounds stupid, but I'm not kidding. Look, you believe me when you see this. You would have bent down to the ground and brushed away the freshly fallen snow just beneath it. A wooden door akin to one attached to a cellar. A real itself. I haven't opened it. The people here have entrusted you all with this responsibility, and I do as well. Whoever killed these those people is behind that door. The unlikely groups exchanged glances once more. This time, concern has shifted to fear and frustration to courage. Well, said Abba Kumov. Gun grasps tightly in his hand. Unless you are planning on waiting for an invitation, I think it's time we put an end to this completely. It was decided that Siuda, Tartuta, and Abba Kumov would go in alone, with the other members remaining outside. To maintain the continuity of the committee should the worst befall them, the trio qu crept quietly through the door and into the rat's maze. A labyrinth of twisting tunnels spired out of every wall, forking and forking again. No crap, Abba Kumov muttered under his breath. These tunnels lead everywhere. The three stopped at the first tunnel, where a faint light illuminated the side of the wall. The three shared a look. Uh, a silent deliberation before Abukamov nodded his head towards the light and the three traveled down. They would not rest until they got to the bottom of it. Nice. 
And right now our growth is really bad. It's really bad. I know we're not supposed to be doing stuff here. And we still gotta go through the comments, which we will address right now, since there's so much reading here right now. But someone says, oh, they like this path because we can literally crowdfund a nuke. Pretty much, it's really awesome. Uh, someone says, more consumer goods might actually give us uh, better, um, more value, more growth. So yeah, pretty much. Uh, do we not want to build, build, build anymore? We still want to build, build, build. And the reason why I'm not really too um, hopped up on trying to build as much as possible, just because it has, a, has less of an effect than it used to. Because it used to be consumer goods are just exactly what you want all the time. That's the most important thing you, can, you need to get. But right now, not nearly as much. I mean, these are still good benefits that we should have and we should always try to get. But still, um, it's just more focused on the economy and such. So. Here, build a couple more. You know what? Yeah, that's good enough. Build some hospitals right there. There you go. Build another hospital right there. Uh, for prison wise, we should go build an Aldan prison right there. So we cannot. So we'll do it. one, two, three. Uh, and then army base and Tuguro. Oh, oh. Tuguro. There you go. Just so we can see where it's at for the army bases. There you go, something like that. Something really basic and easy. So, and we're still doing all hands on deck as well, which is not bad. And our attachment to liberty, yes. Right, uh, did I read this one? Yeah. What do you say, common man? The General Assembly, as always, was rowdy. When Ciudad called the Assembly, every member of the Congress would eagerly set off for Novosibirsk. If they were busy, though few were busy enough to miss an assembly, they brought their deputies in their place. There was an electricity in the Congress Hall that seemed to seize every man and woman. They were part of something, something real. Even if it was just one assembly or some assembly in Siberia, their job, their life, was for the betterment of all men. The excited murmur in the hall dimmed to a whisper as Pietro took the stage, pulling the old microphone closer to his lips and straightened his posture. He began to speak to the hundreds gathered. Pietro was never an orator. His voice was uncertain, and his cadence st stifled. But all of them held it in the hall understood him, and that was what mattered. I was in my bedroom last night, lying awake, wondering to myself, how does anarchy survive? Truly survive? It is not merely by spirit alone. If that was true, then, what of the countless oppressed who yearn for the spirit of anarchy? What of the theoreticians and philosophers who wrote the book upon book upon the ideal? It seems to be clear to that men must die for anarchy, for freedom, wherever it is statists or fascists, or anarchists themselves. It seems that we must kill the vanguards of a state to achieve lasting anarchy. And I was considering this unfortunate conclusion when I realized it was not from the long of death, or loins of death, that anarchy emerges, but from the fear of death. When the state is fear catastrophe, they will leave us to our own devices. When the state is fear of the ultimate destruction, nuclear hellfire, they will leave us to our freedom. And, and so it is the ultimate weapon that will lead us to the ultimate ideal. Men, we must build a nuclear bomb. Oh. While many nations undertake this quest from inside their laboratories, testing weapons on islands and threatening the nations of the world with nuclear Armageddon, the free territory has chosen a different route. Under the guidance of Pietrasiedia, and the people of Russia will assert themselves as a force to be reckoned with to maintain protect Emancipatia's goal of building an atom bomb with the people's help. Siuda will travel from commune to commune asking for people's input. With the millions of people in Siberia comes millions of differing opinions. Choosing between which advice to take and what to disregard and will decide the fate of Project Emancipatia and Russia at large. Oh boy. This is kind of nutcase, but yeah. Krasnoyarsk? Yeah. All aboard. But under the comment was, uh, why is it bad to have a surplus? Um, isn't it good to like to make money? Well, it depends on your school of thought. Some some would say that it's good to have a deficit because that way uh, you're spending more, so you have a higher. So that just means like if you have a surplus, you could be reinvesting that money into your people, into the country, so you can get even higher growth later on. So that's why I think TNO trade is the model. Right now, I'm just going to cut down the debt because I hate debt so much. That's a personal thing. I hate debt. I hate hate hate, hate debt. But you know, it is what it is. Um, so that's one way to take. Uh, another take: just get rid of all the debt and then just uh, go from there. And then reinvest into economy if possible while still maintaining a balance budget. Not my opinion of which one is right or wrong, but I just like numbers. Numbers. I like green arrow go up, red arrow go down. So it is what it is. Um, someone says, you know, do the pull rope. Someone recommends we should do Comey Stellino route again. Maybe eventually. I'd like to try Zidane too. That'd be a lot of fun. And Glenn eventually too. And why are we spending on naval stuff? Oh, we're not. It's just, it's actually disabled. If You can't see. Well, you might be able to see it. These are these buttons are actually grayed out, so nuclear expenditure is there's nothing there for now. And then naval expenditure, it's also grayed out, so there's not much we can really do about that. Social spending, it's all right, cool. But hey, slightly better growth. Yeah, core in these states really hurt us really quite badly, but uh, make your message clear. More academic base, yeah. 
Actually, where, where are we for academic base? Uh, you might as well do it, yeah. Despite our best efforts, most people still don't really know what anarchism is. Most of our citizens can't even bring themselves to think of lands any farther than those immediately bordering the communes. This is something that has become rapidly apparent to Siuda, as he has spoken with more and more residents of the free territory. Inspired by the ignorance he's witnessed, he has written and published a book with his views and the opinions of others of anarchism and what it actually is in the free territory, in the hopes of making the ideology more clear to the average reader. In the belly of the beast, they have hardly stepped foot into the system of tunnels, when the shadow appeared against the wall. Abu Kumov pressed a finger against his lips and silently instructed them to tread carefully. Ab Abu Kumov read readied his weapon as the shadow grew larger and larger, tail swaying from side to side, a gray cat sauntered past the three as if it was an average occurrence for the three strangers to, in to intrude into his home. Abu Kumov laughed under his breath, it was only a cat. A hand pulled him off balance around the corner. Siuda and Tartuta stumbled backwards. Evgenia fumbled with her gun, trying to get a grip on it, but it was too late. A bald man, scruff covering his face, stepped around the corner. He wasn't alone. Held tightly against his neck was Abamukov. His eyes told a story of horror, as if he had seen a ghost. The bald man pressed the gun against his hostage's head, forcing it into the cradle between the skull and the spine. Put your effing gun down, he barked, gesturing to Tartuta, threw it on the ground. Yevgeny and Siuda shared a nervous look before Siuda nodded, and Tartuta set her gun slowly on the ground, convinced he could talk his way out of it. Siuda began his usual speeches but the words hung heavy in his mouth. Where had he seen that bald head? That scruffy beard. Tartuta was the first to speak. Who are you? She demanded. Abakumov struggled against his restraints in a futile attempt to warn his comrades who they had stumbled across. The bald man's grip tightened. Anarchists, that's what you call yourselves? Smear Judeo Bolshevism and crap. The result is still the same. The Vaz warned us this day would come. If only we were more vigilant or more thorough in our execution, we would be staying in opposite positions. You? You were on the bus, Siuda finally fumbled out. You sat with them. You made yourself at home. Who are you? I am the next Vald of the Russia. All aboard! Piotr rested his briefcase on his lap as he looked out on the train's window. Novosibirsk to Krasnoyarsk was one of the most popular journeys on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Occasionally, some families were bored just for the enjoyment to celebrate a wedding or a birthday. He couldn't blame them. People gave Siberia a bad reputation as a barren wasteland, but there were so many hidden treasures to be found. Piotr retrieved a pen and paper from the briefcase and began to sketch a scene of what of the car he was in. He wasn't good at art, but was getting better. Can I offer you some drinks, comrade? A stewardess cheerily asked from behind him. Piotr startled, dropping his pen, nearly caught his journal in between his legs. I'm so sorry, the woman laughed. I didn't mean to. Peter found the humor as well. No worries. Peter doesn't shatter like glass, thankfully. Peter looked at the brown-haired woman, her eyes in a similar brown. Where are you from? She tucked her hair behind her ear. Across Norsk, my father operates a shop in the marketplace. What can you tell me about transporting goods on the trains? Avoid the Kemerovo Junction. It's beyond repair. Make two of them. Put two them on two trains. Um. It's beyond repair. Make two of them. Put them on two trains. It's beyond repair. Uh... I don't know. I want to take the option that is worse for political power. Uh, the Norals Commune. Okay, might as well. See what happens. 1.2, it's not very good, but whatever. Oh, it actually looks like it almost had a slight dip, but it's not quite a dip. Yeah, we're going to pay off that debt as fast as possible, for better or for worse. Attachment to liberty, make the message clear. The deliberations of a man with everything. Dr. Drugov carelessly dropped his bags next to him. There it was, a beautiful shimmering sea, and somewhere far beyond it sat a city on a hill, a place where men could be free and civil, not just one or the other. It didn't matter now, whatever led to the fragmentation of Russia and the rise of anarchy. The question was easier asked than answered to, so Dr. Drugov simply didn't. He'd be more than content to board a boat and leave his madness behind him, but I figured I'd find you here, exclaimed Miss Drugova from behind him. She was not Dr. Drugova or Miss Drugova. No, she fancied herself Drugova the Free, the anarchist. Dr. Drugova nodded, still facing out to the sea. You've come to join me, Natalia. Like heck. Dr. Drugova chuckled. I figured as much. The pair stood in silence for some time, a daughter watching her father's back. A whistle blew in the distance, breaking the silence. I should be going. You should. Why did you come, Natalia? To mock me, to see me off. Uh, Dr. Drugov whipped around in rage, facing his daughter. She was not smirking or attempting to hide a laugh, and instead, tears ran down the young woman's face. Dr. Durgov stepped to console his daughter, but she recoiled back, stepping away from him. Her father opened his mouth to say something, anything he could, but was cut off by yet another blast of the whistle. He looked to his daughter and back to the sea. Dr. Durgov collected his bags and made for the docks. We'll stand together, shoulder to shoulder. Reform checks on assembly authority will become available. Well, we can't do any more reforms, can we? I don't think we can. Yeah, it's either glitch or you're just not allowed to, so... Um, this is... It's... Over? So... Freedom must be protected? Control the Black Army. Well, freedom must be protected. We'll stand shoulder to shoulder. Lessons from Stepanov's coup. There's no such thing as harmless power. Hmm. Versus this one. Just the bare minimum. More decentralized. 
The spirit of decentralization uses a lot of political power, huh? Well, how about a communal spirit? The genius of a communal system is not only the guarantee of political, religious, and economic freedom, but also the unity it provides our nation. Though our commons vary greatly in size and ethnic composition, we are all united in our dedication to the cause of anarchism. Having all lived in the communal system for several years, it is doubtful that there are many among us who would truly wish to return to the barbaric, exploitative, and imperialist governments of old. Let us celebrate the communal spirit that which has brought us peace and prosperity. Mother Anarchy and the Vaz. Oh, so, oh, that's better growth now. At least it's better. Oh, my goodness. The future of the Far East will be decided underground. Peter Siuda is back to the wall, and his closest confidant, Yevgenia Tartuta, ordered to remain still, watched helplessly as her friend Abakamov struggled against the burly arms of the ghost of Rajevsky. I am the next Vaz of all Russia, he boasted. Relishing in the pride of the sentence, you corralled all the animals, and for that I am grateful for the stupidity of the Bolsheviks. We all won't leave here. As a pretender of Vaz's monologue, the wheels began to spin in Tartuta's head on just how to escape the situation with Abakamov's life. She looked back to her gun, but she had already discarded it. Reaching it for now would prompt little Hitler to react to her left. Siuda had a completely different reaction, attempting to craft a monologue of his own to sway the ardent fascists. It seemed as if they were at a deadlock. No history book would ever believe that the face of Russian anarchism was saved by a feline underground, and yet, in context, it made perfect sense. The cat returned and began to purr, rubbing his head against the pretender Vaz's legs. He made some effort to shoo away the cat, but hesitated. Abakamov seized the opportunity and twisted himself free from his captor. In one fluid motion, Tartuta retrieved her gun, aimed and made the world a little bit better. They stopped for a moment to catch her breath and to process what had happened. Abakumov, massage his throat. Come here, look, he pointed. That wasn't a fascist, that was second in command to Rajevsky. Tartuta and Siuda rounded the corner. Ab Abakumov had been snatched behind and saw candles lit around a portrait of Rajevsky stacked on tops of books of hate. Siuda, still shaken by the fact that he was to face to face with a madman, as he got off the bus as a refugee, no less, shook his head. This tells me we have a long way to go before agents of hate are driven from Russia. Tartuta offered no word, reloading her gun silently. I am the next Vod of all Russias. But silence on top of the world. Pieter stomped on the floor at Matt as he entered his home. Or the Ohm, kicking the snow off his boots. Not that it did very much. The snow of Norils came very close to completely enveloping him entirely. His pant legs were frozen stiff, making walking quite awkward. He waddled over to the large reclining chair next to the fireplace and sat. You had the fire going already, Peter called out as the older man who invited him out went for the kettle. I figured you'd want to warm up. Most people aren't prepared for the cold, he said, pouring water into the kettle. Plus, with the topic I wish to discuss, I want to make sure you're firing on all cylinders. I don't know if you know, but your ability to make the rational decisions is hampered by the cold. Really, Peter said, removing his gloves? No, I didn't know that. Where did you learn that? I studied in the Academy of Sciences before the world went to heck in a handbasket, he laughed, scratching at his whiskers. A college friend of mine, what was his name? I couldn't remember for life of me. He studied agriculture. It was his big thing, and he mentioned it to me one time. Regardless, that's not what I wanted to tell you. What I need to tell you is that this nuclear weapon must be kept in total secret during its construction. Letting information slip on it could have dire consequences. It's a people's project. I cannot hide it from them. Of course, who knows what sabotage the scientists have planned. I cannot hide it from them, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, visit the new the Werk Nudings commune? Yes. Yeah, I don't know about this one. Yeah, I wish we could do stuff here, but. Good. 71% worth sports, not enough, but we'll make do with what we have. More up, please, thank you, thank you. 2.3%. Formation. Calm intern, a step towards the free world. It'd be really cool if we could like peacefully reunify with this guy. Zidanov versus us, basically. Seek not your fortune in the dark, dreary mine. Oh. Watch your head. The guy took Peter Siuda deeper into the mine shaft of Rindudinsk. I think we have the morning shift on duty, though, still. Though they are going to be heading to lunch quite soon. Well, if we can, I would like to get to the chance to see them as they work. For this project to be a success, I'm going to need to know the ins and outs of the miners' who thought process and how they go about their daily lives. The foreman shook his head from side to side in contemplation. I think we can arrange that. They probably won't even notice you coming in. The work we do here is some of the hardest you'll see across the entirety of Russia, he chuckled. Let me see here. Ah, there's Dmitri. I think he'd be the best one to ask, as he's one of the more educated of the bunch here. Dmitri, get your butt over here. The man sat his, uh, down his pickaxe and took off his hard hat, using it to fan himself. Something I can do for you? Dmitri, this is Comrade Siuda. Uh, you know, he is looking for some information on a certain project. Uh, Pieter? Nice to meet you, Comrade Mikhail. The pair shook hands, and I need your help. This free territory needs your help. During the mining process, what do you consider the most important part of gathering uranium? Make sure you have lead-laced clothing. Uranium, go for plutonium. Yeah, we'll go with lead-laced clothing. Room for improvement. Adrian hugged his books close to his chest as he wandered aimlessly around the campus alone. Okay, okay, okay. He wasn't alone, he wasn't a group, yes, but how stupid of him to get lost. 
How could one not succeed at walking in a straight line? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Adrian slapped his palm against his forehead. Now they were already deep within the college and he was lost in the courtyard. God help him. He only been here for 20 minutes and already effed up everything. As usual, Adrian quickened his pace. First man in his family to go to college and he was already making a mockery of his family. What was he going to do? tell his mother? That he got lost and they sent him home. He'll never... While well, rounding a corner, he collided with something, sending Adrian's books hurling to the ground with a thud. I'm so sorry, he said, scrambling to gather his things. The woman he ran into only laughed, massaging her arm. You're in a hurry, by the looks of it. Here, let me help you. She bent down to the ground, collecting the scattered books. I I'm sorry, I should have been looking where I was going. I just got got separated from the group she interjected. The flush Adrian nodded. I figured, don't worry, you're not the first. This place is huge. I'm Anastasia, but my friends call me Anna. Uh, nice to meet you. She extended a hand to the young man before her. Adrian wiped his sweaty palm on his pants. Hi, Anastasia. I'm Adrian. She found this scene funny. Well, Adrian, why don't I show you around? Young friendship between young minds. We have seen failure and persevered. I'll give more political power. Oh, fighting for your home, huh? Ciudad will embark on a tour of the free territory in the hopes of not only expanding his own horizons, but also in an attempt to connect with the people of these communes. Our systems are so diverse and widespread that it can be difficult to get a good view of what the people's opinions and thoughts are. The tour of the nation has proved incredibly popular with the people, with several communes preparing large and elaborate celebrations for his arrival. We've seen failure and persevered. The free territory will survive. Fighting for your home. An army for self-defense is really nice, too, actually. You got a lot of defense. So if you're in free territory... Uh, curious anarchism. Actually, I was just looking. Not bad. Our growth kind of sucks, but it's definitely been nerfed heavily since before Toolbox Theory. Fighting for your home is not bad. Bridging the cap. Keep your head down. They don't know. Keep your head high, though. They're not hunting you down. They have no way of knowing. Why were you looking at them weird? If they didn't know why they did pull the children tighter to them as they walked by. Oh, he was scratching again. The armband was always itchy, force of habit. Quickly, he stuffed his hands into his pocket, filling with a paper in one and the knife in the other. He took a deep breath. It's fine. It's going to be fine. Sasha began to hyperventilate. It was not fine. He saw the black army swept through the east with the brutality of people's scorn. He, they wouldn't spare any sympathy for him. The people were looking at him again. Sasha dropped, stopped in his tracks. He nearly walked right past the office. Afternoon, com comrade. What brings you in? The general called from across the room. The man's back was to him. He was in deep within a filing cabinet. Saka parked himself with a blade in his pocket. He had orders. He was always following orders. The man turned around. Can I help you? He shook his head, pushing his weapon deeper into his thumb. Gosh darn it. Gosh darn it. Why would they choose him for this? He didn't know how to send a message. He didn't even know what the message even was. You are Valentine? The puzzled man raised an eyebrow and nodded. Sasha pulled the paper from his pocket. Kill him. Tell him the vase was eternal. Do it, Sasha. Do what you're told to do. The general grew agitated. Who are you? What are you doing here? Do it, Sasha. Do it, you gosh darn failure. Did nothing, Mr. Bounty. Is wandered in by... Wandered in? Wandered in by mistake. Oh, boy. An attempted assassination we have here, hey? Advanced artillery. Go boom. Oh, this is looking so much better than it was before. Holy crap. We will do more social spending eventually, but we'll get there eventually. Yeah, not bad. And we lost some production use, which is fine. Uh, let's keep going with the nuclear stuff. 43% poverty rate. Not bad, my friends. Not bad. Oh, we could go nuclear stuff or agriculture. Yeah, I'll probably do more agriculture. We'll replace fighting for a home with fighting for a better tomorrow. We lose factory output, but that's okay. While in the past, the General Assembly and military placed a great deal of importance into the bridging the urban rural divide in the Free Territory. See you, let's come to the conclusion that said divide actually helps to strengthen the Free Territory. The General Assembly assumed that a greater level of interconnection between urban and rural communes would allow resources each are suited for to spread more easily between the two types of communes. See you, instead, argues that such trade actually works to weaker, smaller rural communes. Smaller communes will need to grow larger if urbanized communes can provide the resources they need. Thus, by eliminating trade between the two, you encourage smaller communes to grow larger. In my commune? Evgenia smiled, placing a hand on Pietro's leg as a vehicle jerked up and down on the bumpy Siberian terrain. You have nothing to be worried about, Pietro, she said with a laugh. This should be right up your alley. Pietro produced a half-smile in response. He washed out the window, all of Siberia passing him by. It was so large, Siberia. Although one could find populated cities dotted around the land, there was so much empty. So much potential was how he put it. Years ago, standing in the Konsk Assembly Hall, Evgenia nudged him, shaking him free of his thoughts. Pietro looked to her and gave a wider smile. You flatter me, Evgenia. You can teach these people just as well as I could. Sure I could, she patted his leg. But they don't want me, Peter. They want you. Peter's stomach churned at that statement. Stepping out the truck in the middle of its skim commune, Pietro was not greeted by the usual suspects. Pietro did not rush out to meet him, chant his name, and sing his praises. No, instead, the commune carried on as it always did, only a few even recognizing Comrade Siuda. Peter could feel a uh, sm smile forming. It was so weird just to see anarchy in action. To see people go about their days as they wanted to, no restriction or commands from a central authority. Yevgenia had to ruin it. She called the people around them, asking for their attention. A small crowd, mostly just people curious of the commotion, began to grow around him. Pietro bit his lip to keep his smile in place. Duty calls, he supposed, that this was 
the, only the first coming of many he visit. He had a long month ahead of him, undoubtable, but if he got to see anarchy in action at every stop as he did here, it might just be worth it. Comrades, what do you know of anarchism? Opportunity for the freshly liberated. Oh, wow. More political power, multi-population and stability, increase Amur's GDP by 10%. God dang, son, god dang, the Far East. It's full of monarchists, statists, Nazis, and them far more. Their wicked ideologies have turned the region into one of the worst in all of Russia. Citizens are under constant watch from the government. Police thugs taking what they want and hurting whoever opposes them. And worst of all, people put into camps for having different opinions. We must do all we can to help these sorry individuals. We'll all provide food, water, shelter, and a commune to live in in time. They will surely become productive members of society once more, and a living monument to what the state can do to people. And the shadow of the valley. It seemed to Pietro that, as if the spats inside the economic ministry were the most petty, stupid things he'd witnessed in his admittedly limited experience in administration, sorting through the letters, he chuckled at the worst ones. I must say, Vadik, your doubt in Corzino's potential for economic prosperity is simply disgusting. Stanislav, I'll be reporting you to the madhouse if you truly believe that incest Hamlet has any potential beyond starving during a good harvest season. The economic ministry seemed uh, laser-focused on feuding over exactly which Russian town or city got funding when the answer seemed so clear to Pietro. Went up unevenly, even in a smaller town, focusing the limited funds they had on larger cities. Um, would only widen a diminished rural-urban gap, and when distributing it to smaller towns could give them a much-needed boost. Less densely populated commons could grow rapidly with just a little boost. Big cities don't didn't even need the money for it to flow into the bureaucratic money holes. I'm so tired of this crap, but show them success. Our success. Anarchism has been proven as an ideology. The free territory has been wildly successful in every sense of the word. Our communal economy is booming, our borders are secure, and the people's rights are protected. However, we are ever conscious of our flaws, and we fight criticism and di dialogue and discussion of the ideology. We will invite ideologues who aren't in support of anarchism to give us their thoughts on why they don't support it and what they would argue is a better system. Above all else, we encourage this discussion so that our people at the and the world at large will see that anarchism is a valid ideology. It seems like we're just trying to prove ourselves too much, but that's okay. Biting to prove a point. Cult. Cut. Capitalists are nothing more than 21st century czarists. 21st century czarists. Oh. A controversial opinion, but one that holds up to scrutiny. They abuse like their predecessors, own property like their predecessors, and kill like their predecessors. And by the same token, capitalists are not more than fascists hiding behind the facade of goodwill. There are many among us today who would balk at that assessment, arguing instead that capitalism is good for the country and would serve to improve the nation. This assessment is most certainly false, as evidenced by the banana republics of Central America, or the rejected poor of the U.S. Their only truth path forward is anarchism, and hopefully people will realize this with the facade of the other cruel ideologies drawn back. Both sides of the story. The rules are simple. No attacking on personal matters, respect each other's opinions, and be civil, of course. The simplicity of these rules left a lot to be desired, as anarchists and men of many different political orientations flooded the Novo Sobias communes opera hall for a good night of good-natured debate. Cedar sat at the back of the hall, watching the debate unfold and duly noting the good points made by both sides. I understand the Nazi mindset, sir, I really do, but I do not understand how you can support the actions of these men after they have murdered so many and left so many innocent dead in their wake. The fascist gave a smug smile and replied, would you kill for freedom, for anarchy, as you call it? Yes. As I would for my freedom, a national liberation. Some will die, but if it means a racially pure utopia, then it is ultimately worth it. Every death? Every child? Every child. And so have you considered that perhaps race is but a construction, that nationalism isn't but a lie cooked up by your ancestors? Ah, I see you have a, a, a mindset of a Jew. Only a fool will deny that certain nations are more superior to others. After all, do Africans yet have a Volkshalle? The anarchists scoffed. The debate continued. Ah, oh, the Jews, I tell you, the Jews. Ah, oh, it's always the Jews. Very good. And we gotta finish line doctrine too. Pull back the curtain and cut. I think you'll find, Mr. Suiuda, that we can be further from the truth. The suited man bent over the, t the table adjacent to him. Stacks of paper precariously balanced on. He retrieved one of his many charts and propped it up on the podium before him. He traced a downward slope with his finger. Look here. The general trend of our military industrial capacity has been steadily sliding since we cast away capitalism. It's foolish to disregard the system that brought America from humble colony to preeminent, preeminent superpower on the basis of ideology. The uh, packed assembly hall began to throw insults at the speaker, men rising from their seats to heckle their perceived opponent. Pietro Ciuda quickly scribbled something into his notebook, underlining it thrice. With a slam of his palm against the podium, he called for the room to order. Now, now, comrades, you will convince no one by demeaning them. Pietro leaned against the podium and turned to the man to his right. Now, comrade, you make the valid criticism of my argument. I acknowledge that, however. I've traveled far and wide around this territory and have seen the impacts of capitalism. Let me tell you something. Capitalism works for those who made it, not those who live under it. Pietro's contemporary had his retort, and the revolutionary had his own. The two could have carried on for a time eternal, and Pietro would have savored every minute of it. Curtains on Capitalism Disdain for tyrants. The state is not but a tool for the powerful to beat down the weak, a tool for the rich to seal from the poor. Uh, 
a tool for the hateful to oppress the hated, a tool for the powerful to accrue more wealth and power. As long as such an apparatus exists, the people will suffer. That is why the Black Army will never s accept such a thing. We will reject the fascists, communists, democrats, and all others who advocate for a state, whether big or small. We will fight all those who try to institute their authoritarian ways on us. The free territory will remain free. Uh, permit input from all. While previously we had sought the advice of experts and knowledgeable individuals on how to conduct research into this esoteric avenue of technology, we've now realized that widening our scope and asking for the advice of all may be more beneficial for the cause. Advice on administration, metalworking, and industrial production are but a few of the various topics the common people might be able to assist with additionally. How could we call ourselves anarchists if we don't, didn't work to include as many people as possible in this process? Nice. Very nice. All right, three, almost 4%, not bad. 72.9%, not too shabby. But then after that one, dealing with the snakes in her garden. Oh boy, Black Army Chaos. Oh crap. Rapidly working military professionalization. professionalism. Oh crap. Emancipating themselves. All right, Black Army and Chaos. How far to go? Oh crap. Um, Starting from scratch. Oh boy. Oh boy, minus 75%. Dissolve the Security Council. Holy smoky fathers. Pack up and leave. Empower the General Assembly. Oh. Oh, that's not good, man. If anything, I think we'll go here as fast as we can. So that we don't get killed when we're doing the other stuff. So, dealing with our snakes in, the, in our garden. Though we've root, rooted out Stepanov and his personnel circle of allies, there remains many supporters of him, or at least his ideas, in the Black Army. In fact, as a whole, the Black Army has become far more authoritarian in status in recent years, taking liberties and governance and war that would not have been acceptable a number of years ago. We should inform the General Assembly of this fact and work to reform the Army, because the way the Army is currently operating is unacceptable, especially if we wish to remain a true anarchist state. This is going to hurt a lot. How are we supposed to do resolutions when we can't do it? Has ignored the General Assembly. No clues. Ooh, as you command. Jesus Christ, that's going to hurt so badly. Oh my goodness, where are we at for military professionalism? At least it's 2.61. It's going to rapidly. We actually might lose political interference. It's Oh. And Omsk is 32 divisions down here. Holy crap, dude. You stop attacking. Just keep holding on, I guess. Actually, because they can't core this. Oh, can they core this? Oh, they can core some of this. Did they leave you alone? Huh. Even me? There was humor in it, the sign. Let your voice ring out through the atom. Victor finally went off the deep end, or maybe he just jumped in the water long ago and finally pulled down the rest of us to his level. Pietro played fair, though. He couldn't rag on Pietro too hard when Pietro had dragged himself out of his halls to attend the meeting, whether out of curiosity or for entertainment. Pietro took a seat near the back of the tally pack room. Producing a decaying cigarette from his jacket pocket, he let the paper hang carelessly from his mouth as he patted himself down in search of his lighter. An older woman climbed on stage, assisted by some Black Army shot shop. She hobbled up to the microphone, test test, are we good? The people were called from the feedback. Good, she said cheerfully. I want to extend my gratitude for those who came out tonight. This project is of the utmost importance. That being said, I won't take too much of your time. I know there's a storm coming in tonight, so there's someone who'd like to stay. Yeah, I've got to say something. Pietro grinned, looking up at the man who rose to speak. This will be good. Have you considered how entrenched a privilege is in war? The construction of atomic weapons is the highest form of classism. Pietro couldn't restrain himself from laughing hysterically, drawing angry looks from the room. Is there something you find funny about your comrade's comment? The elderly woman called from the stage. No, 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 I just... Pietro continued to laugh. He just said that nuclear war was classist. I'm as much of an anarchist as the next guy, but come on, this is just ridiculous. What's ridiculous is that you dragged yourself out of your house looking as you do and still have the gall to insult your fellow comrades. The woman on the chair retorted. Pietro to stop laughing, slinking back into his chair. What were you saying, comrade? Ooh, decisions. Um, yeah, we do mine, we do them all. Yeah, emancipating themselves. Ooh, ooh, that's gonna be so difficult. Rapidly worse and crap. Having brought to the General Assembly a list of several hundreds of the worst offenders in the Black Army, those who abuse their power by demanding tribute from communes, threatening military force against innocents, and even inciting violence on some occasions, we demanded justice. We expected that their crimes would be repaid, preferably through the firing squad, but the General Assembly gave us a different response. They argued that killing these men was amoral and would set a bad precedent. Siyuda so agreed, so from here on out, these men will be served, serving as unpaid labor in the free territory, doing all the manual work needed in the army. Objection. Pietro slammed his hands on the table before him, sweat dripping from his forehead. General Stepanov was a tyrant in disguise, hiding his true intentions deep inside our most treasured institution. Pietro retracted his hands and put them against his chest for emphasis. I was fooled. We were fooled. I figured him a friend. Pietro paused, watching the reactions of the masses gathered in the General Assembly. Despite what we may have thought about General Stepanov, the fact is that he had too much power in the position, something we failed to recognize until it was far too late. Pietro made eye contact with all his comrades, whose next words would shape the future of the territory. We cannot risk this ever happening again. Pietro straightened out the papers on the desk. All evidence used against Stepanov. I recommend the total obliteration of the Black Army in its current form. 
Peter looked out into the silent jury. The people exchanged glances. What was he saying? The people said through their eyes. I don't know. Others responded with a shake of their head. But it doesn't sound good. Carmen Ciudas tapped on the table as he waited. He scoffed to himself. Usually he can never quiet them down. But now when he needs them to speak, they won't. Finally, the young man rose from his seat, adjusting his hat, and spoke in a shaky voice. You're not calling for the death of the men and women who volunteer to protect us, are you, Comrade Ciudas? Pietro stared deep into the eyes of the boy and answered them without blinking. I've always called for the death of the state, comrade. The quiet uh, assembly, general assembly, erupted into chaos, as it always did. Pietro beat his hand on the table, calling the hall to order. What should we do then? Just let them build power? Wait for them to take control of this territory? The room, although divided into many camps, seemed to agree on one proposal, allowing the Black Army to redeem itself through labor. Pietro considered the people's decision, but also thought of his concern how many more Stepanovs hid in the Black Army. He took a deep breath and responded, giving his verdict as the people command. Pietro acts. We must remove all avenues of power. Hmm. Safety first. Comrades, young and old, stand up now to protect our hardest workers. A man shouted from a bullhorn outside the Yakutsk City Hall, standing atop a box of fish brought west from Agadam. Miss Shrenko rolled his eyes as he walked past the protesters. Pietro Siu at his side. Whatever he spat. Those on the project not only volunteer, but also enjoy some of the best amenities we can offer. They always push for more of these people. We free them from the occupation, offer them liberty in their own autonomy. What do they do? They complain. Miss Shrenko shook his head. I'm sorry that you have to see this, Comrade Siu. This isn't the reason we came here today. Uh, Pieter watched the crowd as he walked past. He walked to his watch. He was supposed to be meeting with some holdouts from the previous regime who were willing to meet with an, after an intense a siege. Oh, come on now. They are simply exercising the right to protest. Yeah, well, I wish they exercised the right to be quiet as well, Mishrenko scoffed, or said with a huff. Here's a vehicle, Comrade Siuda. Go ahead. Pieter was still, still watching the protest. Maybe they had a point. Was there still more to do? No, no, not surely. However, even if there was the smallest chance there was, maybe it was worth it. I'll catch up with you. I have to be, I have to be here. Yeah, let's go. I have to be here. No clemency for tyranny. Emancipating themselves. Oh, whoops, that's the wrong one. Uh, we're gonna go back in time. Uh, yeah. That's ignored. Oh, wait, we did accept them. Wait. Accept the General Assembly's judgment. They Didn't the General Assembly not want to do this one? Um, no clemency for tyranny. Yeah. To Mr. Justice ourselves. Yeah, we don't want to do this one. We want to do the other one, probably. So emancipating themselves. Having brought to the General Assembly a list of several hundred of the worst offenders in the Black Army, those who abuse their power by demanding tribute from the communes, threatening military force against innocents, and even inciting violence on some occasions, we demanded justice. We expected that their crimes would be repaid, preferably through a firing squad, but the General Assembly gave us a different response. They argued killing. These men was amoral with citizens by presidents. Syria agreed, and so from here on out, these men will be serving as unpaid laborers in the free territory, doing all the manual work needed in the army, which I read earlier, but then, how far to go? We made great progress in dismantling the status structure and removing those that would remove us or move us in the direction of a state. Yet there remains a great question on what to do with the Security Council. It's certainly the logical step to take if one wishes to completely and totally abolish any trace of government. However, the Security Council offers a lot of benefits and we shouldn't be so quick to dismantle it. Though we loathe to admit it, the apparatus is great for organizing the army and making tough decisions when it's warranted. Destroying it may hurt the safety of the free territory, yet if we don't destroy it, can we truly consider ourselves anarchists? As you command, Erlinska wringed her hands, her head resting against a frozen steel frame of the vehicle. She didn't know how much didn't know much about Magadon. She had never been in truth, she had only heard of it in passing. She knew it was a port city, former home in some of the rushes worse. She would have loved to go had it been on her accord. She wanted to see the ocean so terribly bad. It was something Pietro mentioned time and time again, the way the waves struggled against a frozen layer above it. Pietro, the foolish boy, his grin stretching from ear to ear, was so proud to proclaim that it was a perfect analogy for the anarchist struggle. Stepanov never visited the Far East, as a matter of fact. He dreaded it. He st mentioned it to uh, Erunshka many times while she escorted him from the commune to commune. He didn't come to Siberia on his own will, but found Tom's to be quite enjoyable and often made offhanded comments about how the thought of having to invade the Far East made him nauseous. Whatever he never mentioned was a coup, something Erunshka reiterated to the assembly more times than she could count. They didn't care. They had the nerve to lock her up or look her up in the face until it was for her own good. The vehicle stopped abruptly, smacking Erunshka's head against the seal. She went some pain, but not yelp. She had not said a word since it took Pieter. If it was the people's will, so be it. She wasn't a people then, she supposed. There were before her slid open. Two men stood there, many more behind them with guns. They simply said something about Magadan, about liberation, about work. Arushka simply smiled, just behind one of the men she could see the ocean. What's more freeing than a wild winter? Maybe I chose the wrong one, because we got socialism in the last one, but we lose socialism and stability, so... My bad. Um, emancipating themselves? We can't do penal reform, too, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. And now, dissolve the Security Council... Which is not bad, versus empower the General Assembly. Um, as much as I want to do that one, <laughs> towards a professional army, we're going to dissolve the Security Council. Yeah. 
Her research speed organization would get more war support, division attack, and defense of core territory. So, the council is and has always been a tool of the state. And one through which Stepanov exerted his vile control over the nation and launched a scoop. If we should ensure that such a thing never happens again, the institution must be abolished. Additionally, as long as a council existed, the free territory is always in danger of keeping authoritarianism. While the anarchist ideology might be secured today over the course of seven, several years ago, or over the course of several years, it might be eroded away by opportunistic generals in the council. Under control over the nation was securely in their hands. Uh, such a thing must be prevented. And visit Gordon the Altaisk commune, yes. And right now, how are we doing? 4%, that's really not too bad. 70.7%, .7%, not bad either. Taking pause. I'm not yet, done yet, Evgenia. Pietro had cut deep into his venison. He sawed off a piece of the steak and plopped it in his mouth. He let his elbows rest on the table, arms erect, one fork in a hand and a knife in the other. I know, Pietro, Evgenia Tartuta said, somberly said, toying with her side dish. He spun his utensils and air as he chewed. With a gulp, Pietro spoke once more. You know, Evgenia, <clears throat> uh, I prefer to eat with guests. She nodded, and I invited Stepanov to my own home so many times. He sat right where you did. He ate my food and looked me in the eyes. He called himself my friend. Evgenia set her fork down and looked at her friend with a pleading eyes. Yeah, Pietro. No, 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 Evgenia. Let me finish. He told me he knew how to eliminate our enemies, and we sat here and drafted our plans. Pietro thrust his fork into the table. He looked at me and told me what to do, and I did it. Pietro grabbed Yevgenia's trembling hand. Tell me what I need to do. I feel as if the Security Council will be the same, will be the thing to haunt me for years to come. Should I rid myself of the guilt and dissolve it, or should I try to work within it? Tell me, Yevgenia, I can't do this alone. Do what your heart tells you to do. Cool. Go there. Um, I want tanks. I want a lot of things here, but we just don't have the industry for it. Doing this, trying to go and fight the, the Germans is going to be not easy. Against Baldman and Borman? Wait. I'm not an aggression pact. I'm like, are they at war? Yeah, fighting the Germans is going to be pretty gosh darn difficult. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to that at all. <laughs> uh, freedom must be protected. Reform. Let's go from the mines to the labs. There are plenty of miners who work with uranium on a daily basis. Not only do they extract the stuff, but truckers transport the material. And only then do the scientists get to play with the stuff. These common folk have valuable experience with an element that our scientists are currently having a great deal of difficulty puzzling over in order to make a bomb. Perhaps it might be reasonable to bring them aboard and tap on the knowledge and handling, knowledge handling, and working with the radioactive material. The light of the Lord. What was more tranquil than strolling around the evening market? To Pietro Suida, there wasn't anything he'd rather do. He happened to be in Gorno Altaisk for a meeting with the commune regarding peaceful transitions from the previous administration. Pietro found the people quite agreeable, if a little conservative for his tastes. His tastes were uh, occupied elsewhere, however, as he bit into the reindeer jerky. His mouth was overwhelmed with a flavor from the well-seasoned and perfectly cooked snack. He relaxed on one of the benches, closing his eyes and simply soaking in the environment. And then the screaming started, Do not eat his might, or test his might. He is watching, do what is right. God is the only one who can pass judgment. Peter opened his eyes to see the men in robes, holding signs depicting nuclear explosions inside a large circle with a line through it. Peter rubbed his eyes in exhaustion. God can stick it where the sun don't shine. It's never too late to find religion. Union boys will win the battles. I have to say, comrade, I am quite impressed. What you have accomplished here outshines most of your industrialized contemporaries. Peter said as he toured the factory, overflowing with men, slamming away hammers on sheets of metal. Oh, come on now, Ciudad. Comrade Theodore, so the leader of the communist's largest union, we are humble folk here, really. No, Pietro stopped in his tracks and realization coming to himself. Let's get further the nuclear effort by years beyond our initial estimates. You must devote your entire willpower to the furtherment, furtherment of the project. The union's boss tapped his forehead from side to side in contemplation. Well, I suppose I could try and convince them, but they aren't exactly eager to make weapons of war here. If I were to convince them, they'd have stipulations. They would want the magnitude of the weapon limited and a promise that they would never be used. It must only be for show. Hmm. Well, no dice. No. Oh, I don't know which one. Which one do we want to do? <sighs> it's supposed to be ranged. Well, begin to improve. Slowly improve. Yeah, we'll do it for show. I think it doesn't want last time, but we'll still do it for show. I think we'll do that one. But hey, the economy four point two point. 4.259%? Can we get below 70%? Revenue is looking really good. Almost 2 billion. Nice. Inflation is not too bad either. It's nice. The biggest thing we're lacking though is anti-air, which is a big problem because we can't make any more divisions, which is really, really, really not good. Um, I gotta do that one too. 
back up and leap. The Security Council was never meant to last longer than until the emergency was over. Until the impl implement threat of the end of freedom was gone. And here it was, festering years later. Even after the liberation of Siberia, they had held on to power. Turning into an association of statists and counter-revolutionaries. It was time that it would be abolished for good. No longer would the Black Army be at the beck and call of the officials that could not be held accountable for their actions. Before they could stage some kind of coup against Ciuta and get themselves killed, nobody would object. It was obvious that their time in the spotlight had come to an end. Now the Black Army would serve, out, serve our comrades. Assembly men and women, I have motion for the immediate abolishment of the Security Council. It has served its purpose and its members have been loyal, but no longer must we have a central organization commanding such a powerful army. Assembly not in agreement. All in favor? The vast majority of hands went up. I think this is settled then. Easy as that. Together, nothing is impossible. Our research has come far, utilizing the collective knowledge and experience of the millions living in our free territory. We have fought and brought our society to the brink of nuclear age. Soon our homes will be powered with nu clean nuclear reactors and safeguarded by our mighty nuclear bombs. Our anarchist ideology has proven that, without the intervention or guidance of an overbearing state, independent people are capable of anything, even development of nuclear weapons. Stability, political power, what's not to love? Divisions? More costs? Oh, Charles Call passes away. Oh, it is 1970, but I guess Burgundy does have a chance to fall apart in 1970, but there's only like a 50% chance, so... Oh, well. Oh, crisis? Hmm. My goodness, it's so bad. In my opinion, it is of the most sincere belief that the struggles for freedom has, has at least ratched its climax. Anarchism as an ideology is a fight. It is a never-ending battle against hierarchy. When the people feel secure is when they must be most vigilant. No, that wasn't right. Pietro scribbled the words out. The anarchist struggle is one of unity. The people stand together will be ultimately victorious over the state when, the, when, 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 when. Pietro slammed the book shut. He hated not having their answers. He figured out later he just needed to. I'm knocking at the door. Pietro, I was wondering if you had a few moments. Pietro, a little heavy sigh. Yes, please come in. What can I do for you? I, well, you know, I'm the one to speak my mind. I think you ought to seriously reconsider this. I'm scared of getting it. Is this what you're supposed... Is that what you wanted to hear? I don't know what I'm supposed to do, so I let the people handle it. Nobody said anarchy would be easy. No, this will be us coming time. Harnessing the ultimate deterrent. Uh, what we have he achieved here is simply incredible. Regardless of the end result, we have managed to mobilize resources of hundreds of communes without the need for an oppressive overhead government. We have proven that an anarchist society is not only possible, but functional. No longer can anyone say that an anarchist society cannot organize itself enough to become a threat, even if our nuclear stockpile never matches the likes of Germany and Japan. The fact that we can pose an, an organizational military threat may be enough to protect us. Nice, so we're done with all that stuff. I don't think we'll have the industry for that, but we'll get it anyways. Keep going for more tanks. We'll see what we can do. Yeah, I hope we can get some major buffs here to industry. Because our industry is so bad. Desperate times. People's tribunal found them guilty in all accounts, exploitation, murder, theft, and the whole nine yards. Didn't have to kill them. Didn't have them kill them. I'm sure that's pretty par for the course for you. The man said with a laugh. You see the worst guys, worst guys than we do all the time. You know they were a little fascist out east. Crazy. The man unclipped the ring of keys from his belt and searched for the right one. Anyway, these guys basically were chomping at the bit for the opportunity to redeem themselves in people's eyes. He said in air quotes. Sounds like desperate BS to me. But what do I know? Peter stepped into the presence cell. Two men sat at the wooden table, playing chess. Ilk of the state. Peter said coldly. Both men shot up quickly from the seats, bobbing the table and ruining the perfectly good game of chess. Government Siuda, thank God you have come. We're so terribly sorry. My assistant and I have been journaling for years for in this cell, rotting away, as you should. Pietro said, crossing his arms. I understand your convictions, and our time in turn has shown us the way as well. As a gesture of goodwill, I offer you all of our notes from the previous position in the State University, along with the countless notes and theory since. The man thrust a notebook into Pietro's hands. Please take this and let us go. And keep your book. This is a people's mission. Get out of here and tell no one. I'm going to max out socialism, even at the detriment to ourselves. Another day older and deeper in debt. Hey, is that me? You see the miner's words muffled by his mouth full of food. I know a guy who went all who was there when they evaporated that American island. It took a gulp from a large cup of carbonated soft drink. Guy was a total nut. The workman belched anyways. This guy I know went back west. I haven't heard from him in a few years now, but he was super obsessed with nuclear weaponry and all that entailed. He left me with this list of materials and even planned uh, out a quarry. Peter's face uh, crinkled in disgust. If he didn't know the project wasn't of the utmost importance, he most certainly would have been anywhere else in Russia than this. I appreciate you stepping forward with this information, comrade. You're furthering a very, very noble cause. The miner reclined in his seat. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't remember saying anything about just handing it over. There's got to be a little something in it for me too, right? 
Peter Scal, greed does not look good on you, comrade. I highly suggest you drop this little charade. Oh, come on, Pieter. His face remains a straight line. Fine. You can crap in one hand and put your ideology in the other and see what fills up faster. The man erupted from seats. Wait, just wait. Let's talk this out. Go on and consider a bath. We'll take the options that hurt us more. Because we can. To the detriment of our ability to wage war. But. What's the next one? Not a matter of why, but why not? For all his time spent speaking to the people, ranting and raving about the movement of he propelled from the past to the forefront of geopolitics sometimes, Pieter j enjoyed lis just listening to them. Listening was how we first learned of anarchy, after all. There would be plenty to learn from the brightest minds of the newly minted Tomsk Enrichment Center. Greetings, the scientists. We are war heroes and diplomats alike. I am C. Ivanov. No, the C doesn't stand for comrade. It stands for the presentation, comrade Ivanov, the brown-haired woman to his left said. Apologies, comrades. That's my lovely assistant, Carolina. Or Carolina. She is the brain to this operation. Don't let her tell you otherwise. Ivanov laughed, uh, uh, placing, ha placing a hand on his uh, assistant's shoulder. Now, growing up, I heard a lot of people tell me, you're wasting your time and you will never succeed. Today, we prove them wrong. Today, we make them eat those words. We got inspired. I don't want these darn words. I want action. My action is blowing up your gosh darn house, Ivanov roared. Better watch from the audience, mute in shock. Was this man out of his mind? His ego was certainly collecting rocks in the moon with all out of the world it was. On the other hand, maybe that's what the project needed. Real passion? Peter opened his mouth to speak and said, Carolina, get your boss under control. To the greatness, Comrade Ivanov. I'll go to greatness. We like men with enthusiasm here. Or just people in general. We'll stand shoulder to shoulder. Well, we're going to max out socialism as much as we can, so we'll stand shoulder to shoulder. Your commune is your home, and the communes around you are your neighbors. One should always remember that their fellow citizens in the free territory are anarchists just like them, and this should never be seen as the enemy, regardless of race, religion, or anything else. Instead, the average citizen should turn his attention to the General Assembly. Though it is an apparatus through which all citizens are to be represented, such power could easily be abused if a party or coalition gained too many seats. Watch for the enemy of statism, not just not your fellow man. Green across the board. Pietro sat far, far, far away from the site. In the middle of the forest clearing was the culmination of months of hard work and the best talent Russia had to offer. Comrade Siuda had a pair of binoculars in his shaky hand. There were just many big steps on the way from the Siberian Black Army's journey from petty band of ruffians to a legitimate community and powerful force in the region. The first deal between himself and Stepanov, the wars against the statelets of Central Siberia, taking on the statists to the east, all of them could have been the moment the whole movement fell apart. This was another one of those pivotal moments, he supposed. Comrade Siuda, this is Mishurenko. Peter deciphered from the static of the walkie-talkie. The weapon is primed. I hope you would, uh, are a respectable distance. I would also recommend you cover your eyes. Even at your distance, you will most certainly be blinded. Peter trembled as he put the radio to his mouth. Understood, he said, not allowing his fear to show through the, his voice. Congratulations, boys and girls, today. The Russian people have stood up. Three. Pieter ducked under the brick wall he was sitting on. Two. He braced for the sound of the atom splitting. One. He clenched tight, praying that he could trust his comrades to provide him with a safe distance. Detonate. Pieter hugged up against the wall, ready to feel an extreme wave of heat rush over him. There was no bang, no boom. No sound of atom conquered by man. There was silence. Cautiously, Pieter rose from his spot and peeked over the wall to find absolutely nothing. No cloud, no trees flying off the distance from the force of the blast. No nothing. He grabbed his radio, covered Mishrenko. What the heck would just happen? Well, it seems nothing. Back to the drawing board. Darn it. We wanted a communal... Oh, okay, this one. Oh. Communal uh, experience together. Um... Well, I guess we're gonna have to do this one first. Well, that sucks. I wanted to uh, do it peacefully, but whatever. More production units. Infrastructure is always nice. Uh, we gain, we lose war support, which is actually really not good to choose. We'll do it anyways because we can. Whatever. Five percent. A grand showdown. Final conflict. Yeah, that sucks. I wish we could peacefully reunify with these guys, but whatever. After this, we'll probably just boost this up a little more. How bad is this one looking right now? Minus five. Oh, we're going to lose political interference. We just got that one, too. That sucks. Oh, that sucks so much. Let's get another one of these guys, though. They just... Omsk will just not die, will they? Please tell me you lost a lot of manpower. No, they got a quarter million. Holy crap. That's a lot of divisions. I don't know if we can actually hold out against these guys. That's way too many divisions for us to fight. Okay, the AI's got to be... Are they cheating? Because that, that costs a lot of a lot of money. A lot of money to have that many guys on there and not suffer from any sort of problems or anything like that. 
Lessons from Sephiroth's Coup. It's been a long road to get where we are today. It's almost been a decade since the Siberian Free Territory came into existence, and almost two years since we fled east during the Second World War. And yet, only a few months since Sephiroth's Coup changes yet again forever. The world is changing so rapidly, yet it feels like Russia and the people within haven't changed at all, discounting the bitterness of so many now feel. All we can do is continue trying to learn and trying to adapt to this strange new world. Prisons? Please, more prisons. Please, 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 please. A thousand out. Basic SP artillery, not bad. Go and start doing some of the stuff because we'll probably need it, honestly. Um, I don't know if we can actually really afford to get that, though. That's my biggest issue. We're done with that stuff. Done with that stuff. Plain stuff? Yeah. 21 divisions. Um, this is a bit ridiculous. they got to be extremely weak. I'll be worried about re better research facilities because we're ahead. Which is really nice, actually. But we also have worse very soon. Cutting edge research facilities. Research cost modifier. Oh, boy. How much does that cost now? That's fine. Whatever. 68% is not bad. Like these infantry divisions. Look at that. That's ridiculous. No, they, the AI is cheating. The AI is completely cheating. You know what? I'm going to tab over and double check after this episode's over just to see how much they're cheating. They, they've got to be cheating. I don't know if their economy can really handle that. Finding his footing. Pita Siuda, shadowed by a large entourage of his closest comrades, strode down the street. If one could even call the dirt past such a thing. You're probably wondering why I've dragged you out here. Uh, Valentine told me he needed to get, I needed to get out more. Peter began to chuckle before even completing his tale. That, that I was losing touch, so here we are. He threw his arms up into the air. Peter knocked on the door to the decrepit shack three times and placed his hand on his hip. He waited, his cleek crowding the rickety wooden porch. No answer came. He knocked again, this time harder, no response. With a sigh, he turned around to depart with the door, when the door to the hovel swung open. Who the heck are you? The man's eyes widened. Comrade Suda, wh wh what are you doing here? The kind greeting got a hearty laugh out of Peter, who turned back to the door and extended his hand to the man. Spoken like a true Russian. Good evening, comrade. I hope we didn't disturb you. Uh, the bewildered elderly man shook his head as he stammered out an answer. No, no, no. I just wasn't expecting someone like you to be here tonight. Pietro rose his eyebrow. A man such as myself, comrade, I am only a man myself. I have contributed no more to this territory than you have, however. I always try to do what I can for this community. So tell me, Pietro smiled. The first genuine one in some time. What can I do for you? Well, you can start by coming inside. I've got food on the stove. Food? Food is pretty good. Food is probably pretty good. Just a bare minimum. Or lose socialism. Eh, there's no such thing as harmless power. Although the General Assembly was founded with the, only the best intentions, our de facto leader Pietro Ciuda has come to the conclusion that the organization too has the potential to oppress. The vote of the smaller and more rural in the General Assembly has the potential to override the large and more urbanized communes. The interest taking precedence over those of others, something that is quite unacceptable if we are to continue calling ourselves anarchists. The General Council will now be run directly by a popular vote, and the communes will now be granted even more independence, but taking it a step back. Better, you cannot be serious. Uh, Evgenia Bello, following behind Siuda as he marched down the halls of the General Assembly, Valentine not far behind. Peter continued to walk briskly to the, man meeting, the main meeting room of the Assembly, his oversized coat almost flying off of him as he marched to his destination. I'm not doing this to spite you, you Evgenia. This is a decision long in the making, not simply on a whim. I've always been weary of the General Assembly, noting nothing is to stop another step up from arising. Valentine hastened in his pace and stopped in front of Pieter, grabbing him by the shoulders. Comrades, see you there. I can't let you do this. I understand where you're coming from, but I can assure you that developing or devolving power further down is not going to make anyone's life easier. The General Assembly is fine as it is. Pieter shrugged Valentine's hands off of him and began to formulate a retort, but Yevgenia raced next to Valentine and put her hands on his chest. Pieter, please, I know you're just trying to do what you think is right, but consider the implications before you act. This will make assisting those who need it the most even harder. Pieter took a step back letting his friend's hands fall down to her sides. He furrowed his brow and stared at her, the pair before him. The General Assembly was too powerful um, for its own good, but maybe they posed a solid argument. Pietro shifted his weight, troubled by the conundrum. I will fight against you no matter where. Maybe right, but I am weary. We lose a lot of political power every single day. We get more construction speed, though, and need to consume goods goes way down. Become much more decentralized, which will happen over here. Right? Centralization is 36 out of 100. More factory output, docker output. Ooh, honestly, centralization is better because you get more construction speed sometimes, depending on what you want. So we'll see. Approved main battle tank. Yes, please. A modernized department is also very nice to have as two. At the very least, let's get some recon. These guys will become recon for us. So I have no idea how we're gonna fight these guys. I really have no idea. Two divisions is not going to be enough. Hmm. 
I mean, you never know. We might just do similarly really well for some reason, but... Don't really think so. Can you get any more planes, at least? No such thing as harmless power. On your own in the wind. Sergei bound his foot against a rotting wood floor. He grimaced looking out of the window. The window by the fireplace, of course. Outside, the snow fell like fell like tears from a weeping god. Perhaps god was brought to tears by the past 20 years. Could he, could he blame them? Or blame him? Sergei knew that his god was not only all-powerful, but also caring god. One who wanted each and every one of his children to not only survive, but thrive. Certainly. No people had suffered more than those who traversed life hand in hand with god. Even if god was enraged or mournful, whatever, his frozen tears did little to help. This storm was terrible. The house, whole house could be buried. Best not to think about it. Sergei shut the blinds and turned around. Another storm was brewing, one inside his own home. Sergei's wife cleared his youngest son while his oldest fiddled with the radio. His second son sitting adjacent. They called off a relief hours ago, but no, one single, no single came. Sergei added another log to the fire just to distract himself. Sergei's oldest son threw the headphones off his head. Nobody's listening. There's no point in this. The young man marched off to his corner of the room. Sergei's wife shot him a worried look. Even if his son was overreacting, the prospecting of being trapped in the wilderness with three boys was horrifying. As if on, on cue, the radio crackled to life. Sergei, did you call for up? I'm near here. But now we must do the game of waiting to go to war with the West Russian Soviet Federation, in which I'll see you in just a little bit. Well, everyone, we've gone to war now. Um, and they're not really attacking us. I did tab over to see how they're, they were doing economically. We're doing, honestly, we're probably in a better position, just because we have, like, a billion dollars less in GDP. Like, literally, they look 28 and a half. Um, but, at the same time, they're, like, 110% of their G debt to GDP ratio, so they're not doing great. Uh, we're in a better position. They have a lot more growth. They have about double our growth, roughly-ish. But, at the same time, they're quickly, quickly, quickly getting to their debt ceiling, so. The one thing I did notice here is that uh, we're doing okay. They're not really attacking as much as I thought they would. And by that, I mean they're not attacking us at all. So, we'll just be doing some small attacks. I mean, we're worth Omsk as well. I'm not I'm not concerned about Omsk. I don't want to attack Omsk at all. No, thank you. No, 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 thank you. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Oh, there goes Iraq. Uh, can you guys actually get it? No, you cannot. That's good. Can you guys get down here too? 2v1. Can you actually win? You go there too, maybe? Can you both go down there? But really, just only one of you? Yes. Maybe? A thousand versus twenty. I mean, we got a lot of manpower, so. Uh, we could try to sweep eastwards. It goes Iran, killing off Iran, which is just Iranian things. Um, can you help me support the attack, maybe? It's always good to support the attack as well. We do have a spy uh, over in the territory over here, so Nadiem. And can you help us out right there as well? Overall, not bad. A thousand versus thirty-eight thousand. I mean, overall, the Federation has what? Plenty of manpower. Yeah, stockpile-wise, I got plenty of stuff. I, just, I wanted to do a general attack so badly, but it just would not be worth it right now. Just would not. So we're not. Not bad. Nice, 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 nice. The more you take, the more GDP we'll probably get. So. 3.5 percent is not very good. 64.8 percent is not too. That's actually very good. Actually, very very good. I just don't. I just don't want to attack where we don't want to attack. We don't need to attack. We do have 20 divisions, but it's because we have a lot of guys doesn't mean we need to attack. Ooh, it's gonna be pretty risky attacking here. Five divisions. Ooh, both still able to win. Not bad. Not bad. Lost 3,000 versus 66,000. Pretty good. Cool. We're probably still lacking quite a bit of anti of uh, uh, main battle tanks. I did make sure our recon became main battle tank recon, so yeah, we're definitely going to need to increase uh, consumer good production here. Yeah. Oh, they actually got. Oh, oh crap! Here we go. Everyone, hold your butts. Hold on to your butts. Butts, 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 butts. Need to be held on to. Please, please, please. Now they're going to be attacking like a little bunch of crazy people. Uh, that's the case. I'm not sure that's going to help us out at all, really, in our uh, tanks and stuff, but we'll try it. We did not do military austerity as well, so. Yeah, we'll see. Oh, they beat us. That's not good. Well, we just got off 100,000 more of them. Nice. So far, not bad. I'm glad they killed off Omsk, though. Did that actually limit them? No. That, no, they did limit them to uh, their next focus tree, I think. Could be wrong, though. Not bad, not bad. Just keep holding out. I wanted people who were really good in defense, but Nikola Chapiev, well, he's not known for being very defensive. 
Italy, even Italy gets the nuclear weaponry, not bad. Air sovereignty, just help out over the air doctrine. Um, 3.5. Yeah, not bad, not great, not bad though. 15,000 loss versus 200,000. 200,000, holy crap, that's a lot of losses already. They do have quite a few IFVs though, so we do have to be ready for, you know, a lot of tank stuff. So, it is what it is. Overall, not too bad. I hate this, but it is so... We haven't really gone down, which is actually really nice. No matter how badly we do here, our, our military, prof military professionals will probably doesn't drop. Also, I did notice their poverty rate. Their poverty rate is like 60%, while ours is barely going down now, but... I'll still take us. Ooh, what's going on? Mozambique aflame. Oh, no, not Mozambique. Whatever will we do about Mozambique? 100, 300,000 losses. That's not enough. Let's all change in warfare. Like, we have more than enough manpower. How much manpower do they have? 55,000? That'll be gone very soon, probably. Very, very soon. Uh, can we do anything else here? Yes, we can. Thank you. Get some more encryption done around here, too. That'd be good. TMN, yes. Second out of the long knives. Good job, Borman. Yeah, I don't know. All construction, building stuff up, it's just, it's lost its luster for me. Because you don't need as much. Well, look at that. That's pretty bad. Yeah, that's looking really bad. 400,000 now. Not too shabby. And they're out of manpower. Good. But if they're not done attacking me, I'm not going to attack them yet. And do we have any upgrades first? Yes, we do. Valentiv, he's a very good field marshal. Logistics, might as well. That's a pretty nice to grab. Mechanical computing, busters, stuff and like that. Why oh, not? Awesome. If they're not done attacking, they're at over half a million casualties already. Five. Four. Economy, how's the economy doing? And we went to war with them. They didn't go to war with us. We went to war with them. 64.2%. Not much. Not much more growth, so. Oh, we can get war taxes, too. Oh, we don't want her to grow that much. War support does go down, which we can't really afford right now. We get a lot more money. But I do not want her to grow. Hurting her growth right now would be a bad, bad, bad idea. Um, better logistics, maybe? Are they done attacking us? Yeah, let's go in. Should be able to do well here, especially if we have air superiority around here. Oh, 31 damage. Holy crap. That's... That's pretty darn nice. And honestly, they can't replace any losses that they have, or at least supposedly they shouldn't be able to. Yeah, 11. They only have 11 factories, too. Holy crud. That's so bad. Oh, they're losing. They're dropping divisions. 86. Come on, drop harder. Three quarters of a million have died over there. Come on. A little bit more, a little more. We can't win everywhere yet, but that's fine. Any, up, any upgrades, anything like that? Okay, they lost two more divisions, which is very, very nice. I want more growth. Only we have a, we barely have a surplus though. Like we, have, the bigger the military we have, the less surplus we have. So, but then again, conquering more will give us way more GDP. And of course, trying to core stuff is going to be painful too. But we got to keep political power for now. We'll core stuff eventually too. So we'll see. Now I'm out here, we can. Yeah, we definitely can't take on the Germans with this few military people. But we got plenty of manpower. It's not bad. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. All these IFVs. We, our guys just don't have enough piercing. We should get some anti-tank. We probably should get some anti-tank, especially if we're going to fight the Germans. And we have no tank divisions ourselves. Yeah, we probably should. 59,000 then lost. Uh, you know what? We'll get some anti-tank. Artillery. Light artillery. Armor. Support. Where's anti-tank? It's right here. Anti-air. Well, we already are making anti-tank. I'll grab that one. How much anti tank do we have? Hopefully, playing reserve. Go and come over here. Throw on some more anti tank. Yes. How many pieces we have? Yes. There you go. That should help us out. That should be easily solve our problem down here. Go right there. Cut him off. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. We lost 60, 70,000 versus 900,000. Not enough. Good, we cut them off. That's great. Take the the city centers. Get down here too. Completely surround them. Because eventually we will be able to pierce them. Oh, we already can pierce them. Nice. There they go. There we go. 
They're down to 58 divisions, not bad. Economy wise, 54, 64% is not bad, but. Mm. Not too shabby. It's a little bit of a slog getting all the way there, but we do have 31 divisions. Do you have any upgrades? Yes, sir. No, you're a ranger, though. Wow. Well, of course, not bad, though. Not great, but not bad. Come on, keep going, keep going. Don't let them get any more manpower. 46 divisions, very good. All right, intelligence. I'm sorry for this very long episode, but you know it is what it is. I uh, with all the reading, like holy crap! I love the story development, and whatnot, but there's a lot of reading here. Stockpile. We got a lot of APCs and such. Chaffees. Oh, increasing efficiency. Over the past few months, the government bureaucracy experienced a world of reform. Communication between the various levels and branches of the government is taking place with tremendous efficiency. Benefiting uh, from a sweeping tide of well-earned promotions in a bureaucracy to other, less conventional methods being employed to counter resistance in the ministries, the ship of the state now sails smoothly, unburdened by the incompetence and rotten specter of corruption. From now on, we can expect our national laws and government programs to be enforced with rigorous vigor. The ongoing trend of progress will no doubt mark the emergence of a more robust governance of government apparatus, one far better equipped to govern people and enforce their laws. We'll live in the managerial age after all. Nice. Sure, why not? Can't quite win everywhere yet, but we're working on it. Nice. Keep working, keep working. Go to Ufa. So, we're not that close to capitulating them at all. They've already suffered over a million casualties. This is gonna, kind of ridiculous, man. Get ready. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Let's go. Do you want to go or do you not want to go? Truly tis the question. More logistics, I guess. Might as well. Come on, keep going, keep going. How's GDP doing? Are we growing anymore? 4%? No, that's not too bad. We could attack, attempt tax hike and enact, but that would really kill us. Um, increasing growth. Well, we're kind of okay. Come on. Literally, just beat them up until they die. Lost some production units. Lost a little more manpower. We do have 32 divisions, so I mean, some of the stuff we do. Ooh, if you want to go better industrial equipment, please go ahead as well. Excellente. Wow, look at that lag. That's so bad. But that's okay. It's not too, not terrible. Modern industrial equipment. Yeah, after we threw on all that empty tank stuff, that really helped out. Fighting amounts sucks, but you can still do well here. <sighs> 20 divisions. You guys just are so slow. Yeah, our GDP isn't increasing as much as I would like. Then again, maybe they didn't quirt, but still. Um, I'm pretty sure you could take spread of those pretty darn easily, not gonna lie. Computer eyes cracking, nice. So we got all that stuff done, which is the worst part here. Do that too. Have we started taking any... Oh yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. 26%, not bad. It just, it's literally, at this point, just telling these guys to move. Which is incredibly annoying. Because they, they have no more strength. They're pretty much done. They're kaput, as some might say. Go, go, go. Yes, yes, yes. Why are you going up? Just take out the uh, those guys over there. Fight, fight through the mountains. I know it sucks. And they are 34% of the way there. Not bad. 30. Oh, now it's better. That's much better. 55%. Oh, that's so much better. Even if you can't grow that much, that's still okay with us. Civilian austerity... Honestly, we're not spending that much on civilian stuff compared to the military matters, so. Oh, look, we got some of this stuff, too. Here, get another thing in there. And then grab more, way more tanks. Holy crap, we need way more tanks. There goes, oh, Saudi Arabia's gone. Goodbye, Saudi Arabia. Fifty-five point six percent is not too bad. Yeah, I just keep coming back to this page because I just want to see what's up. Excess revenue, wow. That's a lot of revenue. Tax of 2% from our sales tax. Wow, tariff tax too. Or just say, just say tariffs, but whatever. You want to have upgrades here? No. Four, five, four. We've lost 106,000 versus 1.34 million. They've only 20 divisions max. Come on, guys. Keep pushing in. Can we just go straight for a stick tip car? Like, just go. Just drive straight there. Go here, go to Ukta, go for Angolsk if you can. Mezin. All these good states to. Yum, 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 yum it up. 
Um, where are you guys at? Uh, if I knew the river's going to kind of suck, we're not perfect, so we can't quite do that one yet. Bros, just go in, man. Kobyshev, Kazan, the big cities, Ufa. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty much done. Uh, they've been done for a while, but it's just literally just walking all the way over here. The next episode, which we'll use the second West Russian War mod, it's going to be a challenge. I'm going to be honest. It's going to be a challenge. I might rage a little bit. I'm probably going to rage a little bit, so. They're not even halfway. Guys, move your legs. You got legs. You got to move them. Oh, look at that. It just dropped drastically. Ooh, let's see what happens. 53.9 is not bad. Could be better, though. And next month, please. 53.5 is not bad. Could be better. 0.4 could be even better than though. Oh, 0.1. Not bad. Revenue is still 0.55 billion, but, you know, whatever. Since you're here, you might as well help out here, too. Keep these guys in place. Oh, hello. Is that an encirclement here? I hope there was. I want to get one and a half million casualties dead. Please. Logistics, very good. Come back over here, grab some better anti-air. We're going to need to get some German boys. Oh, believe you me. Take every tile you can. Let's see weird being all the way over here. Oh, look at that. Production units, huh? There you go. Even more for the military. It's fine. Passive defense upgrade. Still have a deficit. 50%? Not bad. Growth is not bad either. I don't want to do this. But I kind of do. Oh, if I do that. Oh! Actually, we did that. We got even more growth. Now, we didn't get that much more money, but whatever. This has turned into a gigantic mess. Gainy? Yeah, go to Gainy. Sictive car. Support weapons. Area offensive denial. Ooh. Rolling thunder, which we can't really use. Um, interception mission efficiency. Ground support. Fire support. Units, why not? Got plenty of army XP though. Oh, we are at 92% of the way there. 10 divisions left. Just a fat, measly 10%. That GP just go up. Just go up, 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 up. I wonder if we can actually get to 0% and then start investing way more into our country. Oh, do we get it? No, it's just auto saving. Cool. I apologize for taking so long. A two hour video is like, oh my goodness. That's going to take a long time to process this video, too. So, mm, Semenyov, that'd be good. Kostrama, Galik, which by then we should have everything done. There we go, look at that. 100% towards capitulation, we did it, my friends. The, uh, the Siberian Free Territory did accomplish the goal of uniting all of pre- or post-World War II Russia, but reunify the motherland. Come on. There we go. One nation under anarchy. Seems like Mother Anarchy loves her sons. No gods. No masters. And do we get an event? What is in the title? Bread Conquer. Pietro Siu does scribble the title out. He'd always felt a deep attachment to writing from a young age. Where did it come from? He couldn't answer. The way his pen danced across paper told him he was gifted, that writing was a calling of his. He liked to think that if he wasn't a revolutionary, he would be an author or maybe a poet. He wasn't quite sure, though he wondered if one could separate ideology from poetry. Was not each poem, each story, an insight into the author, a window for others to peek inside of but never to answer? Freedom has been found in the history of the Russian revolutionary movement. Pietro scribbled out yet another title. Therein lay his problem. Pietro had ideas of swirling around in his head, but struggled to assemble them to make himself more sense. How was he going to make himself make sense to others if he did not make sense to himself? Comradeship, short and simple. The title seemed fitting. Pietro thought of the most influential works of the last century. The books have brought the world to its knees. Mein Kampf, Imperium, the Communist Manifesto. That's not what his book would be. No, Pietro's writing to promise to extend a hand to the world and assist it in rising to his feet. Pietro put his pen to paper. Spurned on by a sudden wave of inspiration, words began to flow out of his pencil until the introduction was complete. Pietro read it back to himself. Chapter 1, The Working Men and Women of Kansk. But that is, once again, the end of the free, or the Russian free territory. Um, in which we have arcade mode, of course, we can disable arsenals, uh, disable arcade mode, which is cool and all. But we are still not quite done. We do not have Central Siberia under uh, with us, or Central Asia, I should say. And I think, at the time of this recording, the second West Russian War mod should still work with Hearts of Iron 4. So... We'll probably go ahead and try to take out the Germans. But if you enjoyed this video, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow. In which we are going to rage hard against the entire Einheitspack. Thanks for watching. Have a great...
rest of your day.